institutions. May I on this note recognize the organizers, Dr. Johnson and uh, Dr. Bahat. Dr. Johnson stand for recognition. Dr. Bahat also stand. These are the conveners, the, 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 the organizers, and we want to thank them so much. This dissemination is one of a series of activities to be held during the eighth BSU week that commenced yesterday with the official opening by the Chancellor and Bishop of Ankole Diocese, Right Reverend Associate Professor Fred Shedon Mesuba. The theme of this research dissemination is fostering graduate employability and innovations. This resonates so well with our mission, producing multi-sector leaders or operators who know the way, show the way, and go the way. Our keynote address presenter, Professor Celestine Oboa, the Vice Chancellor of Mbarara University of Science and Technology, here represented by our lone Associate Professor Charles Tshabome uh, Kazova, and our keynote address discussant, Dr. Kedres Tuliajeda Wizonda, on her way. We are sincerely very humbled to have you here in our dissemination. They deserve a very big round of applause. We appreciate you for accepting our invitation. You are all most welcome to this thrilling academic experience as we learn from today's discourse. In a very special way, I also welcome our Chancellor, the Right Reverend Associate Professor Fred Shedron Mwesigwa, and our Chief Guest, Professor Kenneth Kagame, who is the Chair Council. You are most welcome to this dissemination. A big round of applause, members. I wish to recognize CPA Boaz Mwesije and others who is going to be presenting and launching a book titled A Simplified Quantitative Methods Approach. Mr. Boaz, please stand for recognition. You are most welcome. Mr. Boaz is the regional manager of URA Mbarara. I would therefore like to thank him for choosing to launch his book at BSU and commend him to the Chancellor and our invited guests to solemnly launch his book. I would like to inform all of you that this is one of the most well-organized and attended research symposium ever since we began BSU week celebrations. This is a result of committed university management right from the board of trustees, the council, top management, and the entire staff of the university. They deserve a big round of applause. On this note, therefore, I request that irrespective of budget constraints and competing demands, the university council should consider increasing the research vote of the university. It is through research and innovations that we shall be able to achieve the university vision of being a university for recreating the African society with academic excellence, entrepreneurship, and Christian values. Moreover, disseminations as this one is a clear indicator of our university mission of reproducing multi sector leaders or operators who know the way, show the way and go the way. I would like to recognize and appreciate the organizing committee once again for this year's dissemination workshop. Thank you so much. I'd already uh, made you stand and be recognized. I want to also thank you so much for the work well done. I would like also to appreciate all BSU staff who have made it in this workshop. They deserve a big round of applause. Special thanks also goes to all people who submitted abstracts. Abstracts, without, without them, maybe this workshop wouldn't have been a colorful as it, has, it is going to be, because we expect it to be very colorful. 
In conclusion, I would like to request that the organizing team led by Dr. Ronald Bahati and Dr. Johnson Atwine work with all the presenters and have a special issue of journal articles emanating from this workshop published in the Journal of Development, Education and Technology, Jodeti. I hope this will be done when we improve and we uh, those uh, articles that are going abstracts that are going to be presented they should be able to bring out uh, a series uh, another series or issue of jodeti BSU, bsu was granted accreditation of research esco committee by uganda national council for science and technology uncst in, two, in 2022 being open to bsu students staff and any other researchers local national and international. I therefore implore all those who have publishable papers to work with us. Our God reigns, Professor Gasho Matukunda, Acting Vice Chancellor. Yeah, thank you very much. He deserves another round of appraisal. And by the way, Professor Gasho, congratulations. I think we have you have been leading us for a year now. Thank you very much. And we are comfortable with your leadership. And uh, you still have. And uh, when we see the developments here, even from outside, people are very appreciative of what is taking place here. Yeah, I meant that we are seeing here at Bishop Stewart University. Under you, on the wheel, on this, on the, on the Huachaya Council. Thank you so Speak much. Us. I take this honor at this juncture, at this juncture, to invite the Chair Council, Professor Kenneth Kagame, to give his remarks. Professor. Thank you, VC. Good morning, everybody our chancellor and convener of this workshop, the right Reverend Associate Professor, Jeron Mwesigwa, our guest speaker, Professor Obua, represented by Professor Kazowa of MAST. We are privileged to have you here, sir. Dr. Kedris, who is on the way coming, who is the chief discussant, and a fellow University Council member, the Acting Vice Chancellor BSU, Associate Professor Gasho Matukunda, and top management, BSU faculty and students. I'm truly humbled to be invited here to this workshop as a chief guest. I pray that I may add some value. However, I'm a bit uncomfortable with the, the word guest because I believe I'm at home. So perhaps you should have used chief, chief host. <laughs> the university is very proud of you, our chancellor, my Lord Bishop. We really appreciate that you take a very active and positive interest in the life of BSU in both academic and management aspects. We thank you. Your interest in research is well known even among your ship in the diocese uh, and your publications are well known. Your research interest inspires us. We appreciate. We are proud to host Professor Kazova, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of our Big Brother University, MAST. Only this week, I was interacting with uh, Johnson and uh, Bahati. And I brought up the subject of continuing professional development for our academic staff, especially in supervising masters and PhD graduate students. And I suggested that we could exploit our big brothers to come and facilitate at workshops for that purpose. A supervision of a PhD ETC is not taught anywhere. Huh? So we need to have workshops which make us better at doing that task. 
I did not mention Professor Bo or Professor Kazoa by name. So it's a great honor that they are actually here already doing that. So, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, keep exploiting this local collaboration. I hope they also exploit our expertise. It is exciting to have Kedres who will be with us shortly. She brings a wealth of experience and wisdom from years of service in the Ministry of Education as a director and currently on the Education Review Commission. Presumably, she emphasize the role of research in the future of Uganda's education. This workshop is about disseminating research findings. So I understand this means that a researcher is so impressed by his findings, by his data, discoveries or innovations, that he or she wants his colleagues, wider stakeholders, the community, the government, to listen to his good news, to tell the world what they have done. I believe that the researcher wants to influence change of behavior or change of policy. For example, your data may reveal that teaching online produces better results than classroom teaching, which actually some university has already pointed out. And in so doing, you'll be trying to influence the university and policymakers in the university so that they can change from classroom teaching and go to online teaching or both. So you'll be hoping to change policy. Your research should have an objective on how you can impact on the community. In, in the Bible, in Luke chapter 11, verse 33, it says, no one lights a lamp and then hides it. Instead, he puts it on a stand so that people may see the light. So, thank you, BSU, for inv inviting us to see the light. So, why research? Why are universities so fussy about it? Why are universities mainly ranked based on research output? Among several core elements of a university are research, discovery, innovations and creativity, translating all this into new products, new services and technology. We are in an ever-changing world, changing environment. We have new diseases, like we had COVID recently. So without research, the world would crash. We have to do research so that we can adapt to the changing environment. The governments and the public invest heavily in universities to take the lead in research to help in this adaptation. There is doing research, but there is also teaching research. So we do this at master's level, at PhD level, but we must also nurture the undergraduate so that he becomes a future researcher. Our teaching methods should encourage a research approach. Personally, I've always had all reading notes to me. I want you to teach, give me the broad outline of a subject, give me assignments to go and read, and then we discuss my findings. That way I feel I learn better, I retain more knowledge, and I feel proud and also I grew into a researcher. So, as if you are undergraduate students in your research, let them collect the data. Discuss with them what you want to do with the data and discuss the results with them. Discuss the why and the how. Discuss the outcomes. Excite them so that in future, when they finish, they have already a thirst for research. So, as for your masters and PhD students, you must extract papers out of their work. When a person does a PhD, you should expect, even after writing the mandatory three papers, he should extract at least five papers out of that work. A master's student, instead of one compulsory paper, hopefully, which you expect out of him, you should help that person to produce at least three papers 
and you as a lecturer anyway, you benefit by publishing with a student, don't you? You increase your list of publications. I'm excited that the head of URA is with us here discussing research. Because he knows. He knows why people like me struggle with taxes. Because we don't understand and pay taxes, there will be more revenue without paying for the government. I also wish that more people can pay to maximally and miracle our business is dry. That was personal. So, as a university, we depend on your papers for the university's visibility and the university's ranking. Because when we are very visible and when we are ranked high, we shall attract more students to the university. But even more important, we shall attract it with a well-known university. So by doing more research, by increasing our visibility, we shall be benefiting the academic world. So, the research does not come cheap. I'm sure everybody knows that. But yet every academician in the university expects the university to fund his research. They cannot afford. Huh? We cannot afford. Worldwide, researchers look for their own money. And they do this for being on the lookout for uh, calls for grants. They do this by networking. Hmm? If you approach companies, they may want to sponsor you. You may approach URA and say what is the favorable percentage levels for taxation, ETC. Eh? But basically worldwide, it is research grants that finance research. Eh? Grants, especially from the academic staff through the Senate, must fight for money. They must fight for more location. Because if you depend on administration, you may not go very far. Because the administration may have alternative interests. Hmm? The U.S. will confirm to me that their interest may be in better vehicles, more buildings, trips, whereas the graduate school may emphasize that their interest for as a university is publications, is research. So the academic world through the Senate must put up a spirited fight. Nobody will fight for you if you don't fight for yourselves. Luckily, the Vice Chancellor in his presentation also supported the idea of bigger budgets for research. And as luck would have it, the Chairman of the Finance Committee is also in the audience. As a Chairman, I will say yes if they present their case well. So, we talk about how research is not cheap. But does research have to be expensive? I guess not. A lot of research can be done without any significant budget. As I conclude, I will tell a story to illustrate that. At my age, sometimes stories are the only assets we have. So allow me to go into storytelling. Um, when I was at Makiriri in first year medical school doing anatomy and pathology, I read an interesting book and it made a lasting impact on me. That was 50 years ago, before most of you were born. I read about a young obstetrician called Ignaz Semir Weiss. I don't know if it can be put somewhere. You put the name, I'll give you the name and you put it up on the screen. Eh? So, Dr. Samuel Weiss was a young obstetrician working on the obstetrics wards. Eh? And he made a very simple observation. He observed that too many women were dying giving birth. About uh, 20 to 30 percent were dying when they are giving birth. Meaning, if you walk into obstetric maternity ward, the chances of dying are 20 to 30 percent, which is unacceptably high. Hmm? 
I don't know what the current mortality rates in maternal wards are. I think it's less than, I don't know, 410, 100,000, something very, very small. So if my wife was living at that time, I'd have opted for family planning to zero. So he observed that there were too many deaths, 20 to 30 percent. Then he went on to look for the causes. He observed that there were two wards. One ward was run by midwives. Another ward was run by doctors. And he found that the wards run by doctors had excess deaths, up to 30 percent. While that run by midwives had less deaths, down 20 percent. And he looked for the reason why doctors were causing more deaths. And he found that every day from 7 to 8, the doctors and medical students would go for uh, post postmortems, And they would go dissecting rotting, rotting bodies. Huh? And then they would come to the maternity wards and they would go straight to examine women and deliver women without washing their hands. Midwives were also not washing their hands. But they were coming from home, perhaps after a good shower, huh? and they were delivering the women. So he observed that excess deaths on the wards by doctors were because of something they must be carrying on their hands as they come from most postmortems to delivering women. So his orders on his ward were nobody should touch a woman, examine or deliver without washing hands with soap and water. When he did that, mortality rates fell from 30% to less than 1%. But despite that, the professors opened an open war against him. See, how can somebody so young describe something new? How can he overturn established truths and beliefs? And they fought him so hard, he got demoted, got transferred, but every time he went to bed, they would start touching the women without washing hands, and women would die. So he stopped going to bed. He became obsessed and got a mental breakdown. When he did, his colleagues signed an urgent detention order to a mental hospital, and he was admitted to a mental hospital. When it became night, he started imagining the women dying, so he ran out of the ward to go and save his patients. The Kanyamas, the guards of the hospital, ran after him, and they beat him so badly, he got cuts, which were treated without washing hands. And he died of infection in 1863, dying of the same cause that were killing his patients. Many decades later, they discovered the penicillin, they got a microscope, could see organisms, and they realized that what Samuel Lewis had said many years before was actually correct. And since then, since then, washing hands, scrubbing hands is compulsory in delivering women and in surgery. And post-op infections have dropped. They are very, very limited. So he became famous after his death got many honors, I think even got a post, he got, I think, a Nobel Prize. But he had died. So that reminds me of Galileo, who was sentenced to life imprisonment because he said the world rotates, the earth rotates around the sun. And that was heretical in the church which was governing the country. Huh? And he was sentenced for going against established truth. It also reminds me of Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph, who nobody believed could be saying something new that the big religious leaders didn't know. Hmm? It also makes me think that when you subject your paper to vetters, do they vet you correctly against what they don't know? And yet as a very good scientist, you may be writing about what the world does not know. So it's a dilemma.
So research is not necessarily complicated or expensive. It turns out to be expensive or complicated to create an impact, to influence policy, and to make the university famous anyway. You may recall that even in our own small town of Mbarara, Professor Ogwang did not become famous for his COVID ex. And yet all of us, when you, every, all of us, when you get some cold, you start sneezing, you think of COVID, and you run to the pharmacy for COVID ex. Huh? So even our own here have suffered a similar fate. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, we should all and must do research. The community expects us to do it. The government depends on us for their development. It is doable. And we are watching and monitoring as a university council. I thank you and God bless you. Thank you very much, our chair, council. He deserves another clap. <laughs> Your presence here always energizes us, and we are usually happy to find that you always have an ear here at Bishop Stuart University. And whenever you tell us what is happening, we are, we are usually very, we are very appreciative. Please, we need some more. Yeah. Uh, we have changed uh, on the arrangement of the program. Then we number number six will be number seven, and number seven will be number six. Uh, let let me now. I say we have changed on the arrangement. Number yeah, I discuss and discuss and after. Okay, thank you for that guidance. Uh, let me invite Dr. Johnson, the, the Kayateka Graduate School, to introduce to us our keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rwanjire Milton. Let me just give you a brief intro about uh, Professor Charles Tshawomekazoba. Professor Charles Tshawomekazoba is the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Mbara University of Science and Technology in charge of finance and administration. Uh, he has spearheaded the establishment of the finance department in the same university and as well audit, internal audit department. He has involved in the drafting of uh, initial accounting pol uh, policies and procedures uh, at the same university. Uh, he has published a number of papers in peer-reviewed journal and he has won a number of grants. Uh, please uh, welcome our key note speaker, Ashit Professor Charles Saumekazova. Good morning, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Just over the weekend, specifically on Friday evening, I was requested by my senior colleague, the Vice Chancellor, to come here and give my thoughts, what I think about research and as aspects which affect the university. This is a delegated function, but what I'm going to talk or to discuss with you is my own thoughts as a, an academic staff as somebody who has been working in the university for all my life. So I thought I should do, talk about issues that touch everybody, whether you're a senior scientist, whether you're a junior scientist, but somebody who has been working in a university setting, how can you become and stay relevant and competitive in this changing landscape of university management? university administration. I 
as you can become relevant, stay relevant, and be competitive. Just let us make a short reflection. Some of us who are here, you may not even have done the degree, I mean the interview. Or probably when you are invited, when they advertised people whom they were looking for, you may find that you are the only one who had the requisite qualifications. And we are finally given a letter of appointment. Some had a big list. We are among the big people who are shortlisted and invited for the interview. But the most important thing is, or what you should pose, you need to stay relevant. You need to stay relevant in the university. You need to be, become competitive in the university. But not only in the university, let us say Bishop Stewart University, but in other institutions where you will be interacting with others. We are here during this research dissemination. My thinking is that whatever is going to be presented, if you pay attention to all the emerging issues that, that are going to come on the board, that are going to be discussed, at the end of the day, there's going to be some takeaways, something that you are going to go with to be an excellent researcher, an excellent academic staff, an excellent member of Bishop Stewart University, so that even when you go in a conference and another conference, then you should be in a position to present because you are learning, and this is a learning research dissemination. Now, this is the outline. I thought I will talk about introduction, God self-assessment, but three, num three, number three and number four, as an academic staff of Bishop Stewart University, you should be in a position to get involved in those four components, three up to five, administration and management. Then at the end, I should be in a position to give out some thoughts. Now, let us try to comment briefly about the keywords of this presentation, becoming and staying relevant. There are now new skills that are, I don't know what is happening. By the way, I didn't say good. When I looked at your face, I would have given you a hug, but uh, now you can see here. Uh, Or we, if it fails, we'll just leave it fresh since it is. Can I? No, I can. I can. Sp yeah, you're working on your own. So uh, I was just commenting on the about the keywords, which I had, had already been flashed. It's how to become and staying relevant. Nowadays, there are new skills that have come on board for you as an academician, which we need also to address. For example, when you talk of green skills for green jobs, everybody now is looking at the triple bottom line. We are, for example, even we are greening the human resource management, we are greening the procurement functions, we are greening our curriculum, and this is the knowledge that is needed by the potential em employers. Therefore, the most important thing for you as an academician, if you are to remain relevant, therefore you need to integrate these aspects in the curriculum development and implementation. For example, the changing role now of university, now everything is on the Library, the e-library, so you and me, we need to appreciate and understand of what is happening in the e-library and we use some of those resources. But remember, as we go there as an academician, it's not yesterday. Yesterday, for, for example, the academician would be having a textbook and we're the one who has got that textbook. But now the information is freely available. But very important, you have to compete. We are in the competing world. 
both universities, individual academic staff, we have competed amongst yourselves. Therefore, in the process for you as become, of becoming relevant, of staying relevant, of being co competitive, therefore, you have to compete and remain ahead of the crowd. But then the management of universities, higher education is rapidly changing, both at the national level and the regional level and international level, it's changing. Now, for example, we have got different faces of the students who come to the, ins to the institution. They are from different regions, even when you are ranking the performance of higher education, the performance of universities. Therefore, now they start saying, oh, what is the proportion of the international students to the national students? Now, what is the proportion of female and male to the internationals? What is the proportion of, for example, the academic staff of the various academic units in the university, even when we are talking about the gender perspectives, they come on board. Therefore, the management of the university is changing and it is addressing different components. So if you are to remain as an academic staff, you are to remain relevant, uh, you are to remain competitive, you have to take into consideration some of those components. And previously, sometimes, you would, for example, once they invite for a Viva Voce, be it a dissertation or a PhD and the rest of it, you sometimes even look at your area which you are interested in. But my thinking is that now you need to attend multidisciplinary components of research. Even if it is somebody is presenting and is from, let us say, medicine, nursing, or any other department, so if you are to remain relevant, you have to stay relevant, you have to be competitive, make sure you attend even some of those research disseminations, some of those PhD presentations, some of these uh, progress reports that are being presented. Now, the purpose of research dissemination is very clear, but there's also some verses in the Bible that talk about re research. Just one of them is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. These things God has re revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches. Now, they use search. Research is to do search. Look for additional information. Now, there is another one in Job 29, 16. I, I was a father to the needy, and I investigated. You can see, investigated the case, which I did not know. In other words, that is research. If you look at Psalm 77, uh, verse 5 to 6, I meditate within my heart and my spirit makes diligent search. I cannot go to the different ones. But the point is that research is recognized in different fields, in different arenas of our social working. Now, I was posing, now for, for example, why, where are we as far as higher education? What is happening in higher education? higher education institutions in Uganda. What is happening at Bishop Stewart University and the different universities? Now, the university landscape is changing in terms of new students, as I mentioned. The environmental shifts, now we start even looking at the different courses or different uh, subjects which you teach, even when you stand in front of the lecture room. Now there are different aspects you need to bring on board. Earlier on, the chairperson of council was mentioning about the technology, use different methods of delivering, or there is now the order of the day, ICT. Now, if you don't know that, you cannot be relevant. You cannot be re remain competitive. We have got issues of routes, the different job ma markets. Now, the job market is now looking for people who have got hands on, the doers of things, those who understand how the different businesses work. Now, that's changing. Now you cannot simply, previously, for example, in the 60s and 70s, you would teach at Makere and the rest of it before even you finish your course, the job is already assured for you. But now, at that time, the employees were looking for people to go and work. But today, it is now the university and the students who will go and look for the job. Therefore, the job market is changing. Then for you, you have to, as a lecturer, as somebody who is delivering, of course, you'll be happy if you meet your student who is working in an organization simply because of the knowledge which you gave out. Competition is the order of the day. I don't need to go into the details. In other words, in conclusion, in the 
university landscape, there are new rules of the game. New rules of delivering when you stand in front of the lecture room, new rules of the information which you give. Now, but once you reach there, now we need to do a self-assessment, a self-evaluation, you and me. You evaluate yourself and when you stand in front of the lecture room. For example, if you are teaching something to do with uh, enterpri enterpri uh, enterprising, now you ask yourself, is yourself enterprising? Is what you are teaching on an abstract from the textbooks or you are practicing it? But don't only be enterprising or don't only also teach what you do not practice outside there. Therefore, as you teach, as you stand in front, then you always say, okay, if I'm giving these good aspects, I'm saying ethics. I'm talking about ethics as a lecturer. Am I practicing ethics? If I'm talking about time management, I'm talking issues of enterprising, I'm talking of issues of teamwork, I'm talking issues of collaborations, am I actually practicing? So that's the self-assessment component, but remember, your number one friend is yourself. Don't seek for the encouragement from outside colleagues. Find it from inside. First, evaluate yourself. Now, earlier on I was talking about the example of a mirror. If you imagine you are looking through the mirror, when you joined Bishop Stewart University, or the job you are holding today, what were you at that time? Now, assuming it is 10 or 15 years from now, have you changed? Is there something which you have added on? Now, even now when we are talking of 15 years from the time when you got this job, what about 20 years from now? What did you see yourself? So in other words, don't think the encouragement from outside, find it from inside. The only person who can stop you is yourself, and yet you are the only one who moves yourself forward. Now, again a reflection, my thinking. When we are students, either secondary or when we are in the university, look at this, think about this. The deans were there. The deans of students, we are at your service. For example, if you are not in your hostel, there would be somebody to say, ah, sometimes even the parents would visit us, some of you. But now, when you are an academic staff, almost you are your own prefect. And you monitor your work. You heard that when they call your name, are you poor, but not you? Sorry for. Can you greet your neighbor for just a minute, please? I would remain and finish. So what I was trying to, to say, previously teachers and parents and other key st stakeholders will look for you. Then it's not common now for the faculty, you as a staff, your, your own referee. For example, at senior six, you would even get an F in a certain subject, but you get access to the university. But when you are in a university and you're an academic staff, we need to see that you are all around. Therefore, if you are to remain relevant, you are to become relevant, you are to remain competitive, don't ignore that anything is happening in higher education landscape. Don't underestimate what is happening in the education landscape. Try to create the future. Try to continuously look at yourself and continuously sharpening yourself and positioning yourself as a champion. 
understand your self-awareness, the development, self-reflection, and continue monitoring yourself. Continue encouraging yourself to be an excellent loving fan. Even auditing or management accounting. But at that time, there was a new agenda of sustainability accounting, of looking at social accounting and environment accounting. So I wrote a concept note. Once I wrote a concept note and I took it to somebody who was senior from me, he said, ah, but you know, you are going to look at sustainability accounting and specifically environment accounting. Are you going to get somebody to supervise you? Are you going to do this? Of course, when you're talking to a senior supervisor, you keep quiet and the rest of it. I went back and I reflected. I reached home and looked through my personal story, looked through the mirror, and I said, Kazova, I will ensure I research on this. This is the best. And eventually, the rest is history. And I championed myself, and it has made me be what I am. You are your, your own course. I want you to stick with your agenda. Now, when you join an institution like this one here, don't be an absentee staff. Understand me, please. Don't be an absentee staff. I know if you focus on short-term aspects of you as an academic staff, at time T, you remain where you are. But others who are focusing on what they are supposed to be as an academic staff, I know sometimes we are swayed to go and look for other resources outside. You find yourself going into five or three, or three universities and the rest of it. You are spending most of your time working. But go on your desk. Go on your desk. Do research. Do what you are supposed to do. Yes, now you will not get the resource. But after some time, when you become a better scientist, a better supervisor, a better academic staff, I believe you should do, be in a position to, to get money. I remember when the university was starting and I was teaching, so they wanted to give me, the late academic registrar wanted to give me two course units to teach. And I looked at myself, I said, no. It would be an affair for me to teach two course units. I can come and talk from abstract on my subjects. But I knew I would be cheating the students. I said, I only want one course unit. And that's what I taught. Then the other time which I was used for the second uh, course unit, I went and started learning research proposals and the rest of it. And here I am, I am a scientist. Sometimes they look at my profile. Just one that was from one university in Ethiopia looked at it and he wanted somebody to work with in a certain proposal. They simply wrote to me and the rest is history. So don't emphasize on short terms, please, ladies and gentlemen. You are strengths yourself as an individual and try to see whether you are still relevant, you are still competitive. Now, you cannot be in a university setting like this one. You take one year, two years, three years, even when you have not written a paper. When you have not mentored somebody. Now, there are some of us, I'm not saying not in this room, please don't get me wrong. Sometimes, some of us who were brought up in a rural setting, there is where you cross. There is a bridge, and they can put their log to use to cross. Some of us in a university setting here, you cross the bridge, you get your master's, you have been mentored, you get your PhDs, you have been mentored. But once you cross over, even the log which you used to cross to go to the other side, you pull it away, or sometimes even you pull it and throw it in the, in the water. But an excellent if you want to remain relevant, you want to remain competitive. My thinking is that once you cross over, you know the harms you negotiated around, stand the other side and start encouraging the other person on the other side. You say, ah, there in the middle there is a problem. Sometimes you can even go in the water and you tie your trousers or whatever, and then you pull somebody from the other side and the person will cross over. Just as an example, I got my PhD. It was awarded to, uh, uh, conferred to me in February 2011. I have already supervised 
up to completion, six PhD. Now you can see six PhD and the other number of masters. I have written grants because of that knowledge. I remember some of you who were in Masaka when I was trying to, write, to learn how to write grants and the rest of it. I had even written my concept. It was my own idea. But I, was, I did not have a PhD. And they wanted the, sci the lead scientist to have a PhD. I wrote it. I went there and it was funded. I did not become the PI, but I was a co-PI. But the most important thing, I was trying to learn. But now I become a PI. So this is what I'm trying to say. Go and mentor others. But look at yourself and assess your different strengths. And you know, in a university setting, in Makerere, before the Akiki Mujaji report of 1999, they used to employ people who only had masters. Of course, there were very few PhD holders. And this is what, but when they came up with that, they said everybody in the university should have a PhD. And I think they gave them a grace period of, was it six years or something of that nature? Now, if you don't have a PhD, even at Bishop Stewart University, I can vote in the next five, 10 years, we'll be only looking for PhD holders. Therefore, look at the different strengths you have, the different opportunities you can harness, and the slates and the weaknesses, and you can address them. And I believe when you address them with the university, they should be in a position to be solved. Remember this. A sleep is not a fall, but you can sleep and wake up. Even, by the way, even a child, when he or she falls down, a child, when he or she fa falls down, when there is no old person there, the child will wake up and cry going where there is a, an old person. So even for you as an academic staff, is that even when things are not going right in a certain area, as far as academic advancement, just wake up and go and look for somebody to extend an academic handshake. Now, another important component of your work as an academic staff, of course, there are research, networking, and grant writing, which I have mentioned, and there are different areas which you can research on. But as you look at an area, ask yourself the following. What extent is your study contributing to improved, let us say, environment and natural resource management, as an example? How is your study addressing demographic challenges and contributing to economic development? How is it integrating other disciplines? How is it translating ideas into business? How are you integrating ICT and gender perspectives? What about those other cross-cutting issues like disability and HIV? Now, have you linked your research to the national development frameworks? And for example, national development frameworks, we have got here the NDP3, we have got Vision 2040, we have got African Agenda 2063, Sustainable Development Goals. But how is your study going to inform policy? And these are different components, different policy frameworks, because you want to wait your study to the agendas are in place. And please also, how is it linked? How is it going to contribute to the NRM manifesto? How is it going to contribute to the East African Community Agenda 2050? So these are components which you should be in a position to put it. But even a research, if you are from BSU, we have got the strategic plan. So you have to link your research to the strategic plan of Bishop Stewart University. So that now, once you do that one, it means you are, you are going to contribute knowledge to the agenda of Bishop Stewart University. And I know in evaluating criteria, different aspects of from my participation, what I have seen, they always emphasize a number of critical area issues that they need to be included in whatever research, by the way, be it academic, be it applied, scientific quality of how you present the ideas, the relevance, effectiveness, efficiency, impact, and sustainability. Those are the different components, and uh, among many, which they want you to emphasize 
in your study, in your research. And I know today when you'll be making a presentation, we want to see your quality, the scientific quality. We want to see the relevance, the effective and efficient impact and sustainability. I have written my colleagues and I, we wrote a small paper, it is on the website, an investigation of techniques of writing a fundable research grant proposal, practical examples from a developing country. I did it with my colleagues, with my colleague from uh, Bustema University, MOOBS and Ambara um, University. When you get the slides which the secretariat has, you will read and see whether it makes sense to you. Now, another component for you as an academic staff is to teach. That's why you have been recruited. But as you teach, do you have self-drive for improvement? Improvement in academia. You research, for example, now we are getting, going to get new knowledge. If the new knowledge you get from the different presentation, can you go and also deliver? Teach rather than instructing, please. Communication is very important, emotional intelligence, be calm. Then preparation, being informed. Patience and time management. And I urge you today, attend and listen attentively on this dissemination. You'll come out better sharpened. Another role, another component is your community engagement and partnership. This is now, we are not in our own silos, in our own box. We are supposed to go outside and learn from the community. Try to make Bishop Stewart University relevant. We want to see what they are doing because this is where most of the time for our graduates are going to be. So we need to go outside there. But just quote one, through our partnership with government, industry and community organizations, we must make a lasting and positive contribution to the communities in which we work. We need to go outside there. Sometimes you may be given an administration or a management role of the university don't only call yourself the dean or the head of the department, but there has to be a trail of events. For example, is your department or your academic unit the, or is the last to submit the results, as an example? Now, if you are a head of a department or a dean, I know you are highly educated individual and skilled leaders. You are supposed to direct and oversee your academic unit activities. You serve as a liaison management, and for the faculty, you lead the scholarly research and the motion activities of the department. Now, scholarly research. If, for example, you are making a report at the end of one academic year, what sort of information have you put in? Thank you. What sort of research have you come up with? Nature positive work for sculpture, develop student affairs. Now, as I make my final uh, comments about how to become and stay relevant and compete in this changing global higher education, I believe for you coming here today will improve your success of research proposals. It's going to increase, 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 strengthen research at the BSU. Now there's going to be Builds University Trust. This is the conference which we are on. It's also going to improve, increase the, or improve the marking and the grading of research reports. We are going to get even to know how to do some of the research, how to craft statements of the problem. By doing that, we are reinventing ourselves as BSU. It should be in a position to pro promote partnerships and networks and even on top of that, maintain them. Generation of applicable knowledge. And then improved knowledge levels will lead to stakeholders and i.e. students and academicians understand expectations. This is why we are here. A quote that is not mined by Chizito, every successful person has a painful story, so never give up. A, ski, a school bell that sounds as a disturbance at 8 a.m. or sounds interesting at 2 p.m. It's just a matter of time. So don't envy anyone. Not everyone walking fast has an appointment 
some have running stomachs. Another quote by Edoa, when money, that's when money, but now instead of money, I have inserted their university, realizes that it is, good, it is in good hands. It wants to stay and multiply in those hands. Probably I can repeat. When money, now I have put their university, realizes that it is in good hands, it wants to stay and multiply in those hands. Now, why have I put their the, the university? You want to become and stay relevant, competitive. But once you have been given that appointment letter signed by the university secretary, make sure that you perform, you do your job as an academic staff. Don't be, you know, sometimes there are people who are grudging academics every time, even something that is positive, it's just only grudging. You'll never talk something good about BSU or about the organization. My thinking is that when the university re realizes that, certainly they cannot continue trusting you. Another quote, Benjamin Franklin, you are not worth the world. Now, world I have put the university is usually determined by what remains after your bad habits are subtracted from your good ones. Now, as you enter the gates of BSU, come with your good habits. Leave the bad habits outside. Sometimes, you can put them in a box and mistrace, or even in a safe and misplace the password. What? So that you, or even you smash the box. And sometimes when the box is a stumbling block, smash it and throw it away. Thank you for listening, but very important. Stay into the university. Become, stay relevant and competitive. And accomplish big success for the university. But the focus, focus areas or fields for you are the following. Teaching and research. Resource mobilization, networking and grant writing winner, community involvement and partnership, grow and keep networks. And in my last slide, I had flashed. It's the gold for CES. So I had showed the picture of somebody who has lifted Bishop Stewart University at the international level who recently won a gold medal. And I thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much for our keynote speaker. He deserves another round of applause. So please. Yeah, before I invite Dr. Johnson to introduce to us our, our discussant, let me take the opportunity to introduce our own Mama Dr. Aris Wesigwa. Thank you very much for joining us. Dr. Johnson, come and introduce to us our discussant. But now, I want to inform you time Look at the program. Make sure you, you, whatever you are doing, do it within that specific time. Thank you, Dr. Milton. Uh, our discussion today is none other than Dr. Kedris Yagenda, who is a member of Education Policy Review and Commission. She is an educationist. She was the Director of Education Standards in the Ministry of Education and Sports. Prior to that, she served as the Commissioner for Secondary Education Standards in the same ministry. She's a member of several governance bodies of education institutions, including BSU. She has published a number of educational research and presented a number of papers in inter international conferences. She holds a PhD in Education Management from Mkumba University. Uganda, a Master of Science degree from Leicester University in UK, and a Bachelor of Science degree and a Diploma in Education from Makere University, Uganda. Please join me and we'll come our discussion today.
but um, at least I see in our midst uh, the chancellor, who is also our bishop, and I also see the chair council, and I would wish to request that I use the same uh, protocolist that was used before I arrived. Granted? Okay. Um, I'm very excited to be able to be part of this morning and probably afternoon session as we look at research uh, dissemination. Uh, he's told you who I am. I just want to add that I'm also a wife to Canon Henry Triagenda. I'm a mother of adult children and a grandmother of three. <laughs> I think if there is one um, word you'd want to use to describe me, uh, maybe two words. One is that I'm an educationist. That's me. That's me from day one until Christ calls me home. Maybe the second you'd want to use to describe me is a sinner saved by grace. So in a nutshell, that's me for those who have not been interacting with me closely. I'm delighted to be able to participate today and especially to try and discuss in a few words, in a few minutes, a very, very important paper that our um, presenter has just completed. It is unfortunate that we were not able to uh, see it on the screen, but he highlighted very, very key things and I'm not going to repeat any of them. I'll only make a few comments generally. The first comment I thought I would make is that if we are to become and stay, I thought those were very, very important, becoming and staying. You can become and not stay. You can fail to become. If you fail to become, then you can't stay. But you can become and fail to stay. And that is sad. And we have heard it many times in society. Say, oh my goodness, what happened to so and so? You know? So the, the theme is that you become, but you also stay. Stay what? Relevant. And our speaker I really went to depth to try and highlight the relevance that is expected of us. I would wish to remind ourselves that we are in the 21st century. I went over the logs you are talking about, and sometimes when the rains would be heavy, they would sweep off the logs. <laughs> so you are coming from school, and you can't get home because there is no way the log has been swept off. So today we are living in the 21st century, which is generally managed by science, information, and technology. We can't go back to the 20th century. We can't go back to the 19th century. We are here. We are. So we have to be relevant here in the 21st century. We cannot afford to be what our children call us, the BBC, the Born Before Computers. Because we are in it now, we can't jump out. Um, I came reading uh, the abstracts, and one of them uh, is looking at um, you know, the, the different changing of terrain, and I thought it was an important one. So we are living in this 21st century that is governed by that. One of the things we call science is the ability to look at problems and find solutions, and that is what research is. Research is identifying a problem and working around it and finding solutions. The science that governs the 21st century is not the hard science of chemistry and physics and biology and maths. It is the ability to look at what is around you and work through it and come with a solution. Even in those so-called hard science, I think why they called them science was that you'd go to the lab and you'd be given these two wires and then you'd be asked, how do you make sure that the light, uh, the, the light of this bulb comes on? So you have to think around it and find a solution and then when the light has come on, you have connected the circuit, isn't it? I have a background of PCM so you can hear my examples. <laughs> you can hear my examples. 
But that is it. So we are in this now 21st century that requires us to continually co-create knowledge. Co-create knowledge. How do you do that? By doing research. It can be a simple research. It can be an extended research. But we still have to do that. What you become is determined basically by two things. One, what you are. Two, the environment in which you subject yourself. You have known uh, some young people, very brilliant, very you know, committed and focused, and they join an institution and they get themselves in an environment of hooligans, and by the time you know it, they are part of that team. They were not that, but they have become. Why? Because of the environment to which they have subjected themselves in. Now, for you who lives now and works and studies at the university, your environment is cut out. But you can choose to have a positive environment that will spur you on. An environment where you are asked the whys. An environment where you are willing to learn. An environment where you are willing to pick everything and find more on it, which is research. Or you can choose to be part of the negative environment. I heard him apologizing. I didn't think he needed to. You can commit to be in the negative environment. There are some people who have graduated in being negative. And they will never see anything good. When you have water in a bottle like that and it's halfway, a negative mindset person will tell you it's half empty. Yes? But a positive mindset person will tell you it is half full. Am I right? So, the, 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 the mindset of the people you live with will affect the way you can move forward. Because it will affect your attitude. Uh, some time ago, you know, these messages they sent on WhatsApp, someone had sent the word attitude and had broken it out, and it came to 100%. 100%. And other things, you know, fell short. A friend of mine, he's now going to be with the Lord, he used to say it quite regularly, that attitude determines your altitude. You know altitude? Any geography teachers or those who learn geography? Yes. The altitude of BSU, what is it? Does anyone know? What is the altitude of BSU? It's definitely different from the altitude of Kabari, isn't it? Yes. So your attitude, that which informs the way you look at things, will determine your altitude. It will determine how high you can go. If your attitude is negative and is always critical, you of course criticism is excellent if it's positive. But if it's always negative, it is poisonous. It doesn't only poison you, but it poisons the people you relate with. So the environment you choose is very critical if you are to progress. Those who build you up, um, one of these uh, TV preachers called Joel Austin is one of those very, very positive people. <laughs> and one time he was preaching on the story of David and Goliath. And he said, when this little boy with no armory on him came online to represent Israel, when he looked at this huge, tall, gigantic, you know, experienced warrior, fully dressed, he could have thought in two ways. He could have said, no, this is an impossible assignment. I shouldn't even risk. But he could also have thought, and he said, I'm sure that is how he did, that, oh, he's too huge to be missed by my uh, stone which I'm going to throw. Same, same spot, you can say it is too big to be attempted, or you can say it's such a big opportunity that I can't miss it. So your attitude, your attitude, your attitude is extremely important. As academicians and in an academic environment, one thing we have to commit to is long life learning. 
Um, we have a Zoom group with my family where I'm born, so we have prayers, uh, an hour's prayer once a week. So um, I started a course recently, and I told them, we have to change our times. We used to meet Saturday mornings, physically before COVID, and then we went on Zoom as COVID came on up to now. So we did Saturday. But now this course I'm doing starts at 5.30 a.m. in the morning on Saturday up to 8.30, three hours. We have two units per, per, per study. And so I couldn't now be part of it. So I told them, uh, so when I went visiting my younger brother who has younger kids, they were asking me, so auntie, you are also still learning? Why? What are you learning? <laughs> you already have a PhD. You have done all these things. What are you learning? But learning is a lifetime. When you stop learning, you stop living. When you stop learning, you stop. Even when you come and just sit, you will learn. When you go to, when they are going to serve us tea, I'm sure. When you go to the tea point, you can still learn. You can see how so-and-so puts in his sugar. What does he start with? Does he start with a tea bag and put water and then milk? Or does he start with milk and water and then put a tea bag? Why does it happen the other way? That is learning. Okay? When you go out into the mud cities, I come from one now in Kampala, with border borders all over the place, there is still a learning. So if you stop learning, you stop living. So for us in the academia, the academia, learning, learning, learning. And because knowledge is dynamic, we have to be off at it if we have to be relevant and remain relevant. The presenter talked about self-management, and I thought I would just add one more uh, statement on it. You cannot manage things outside you if you cannot manage yourself. If you cannot develop a system that will put you in a way of achieving your goals, if you don't know how to set your own personal goals for your spiritual life, for your social life, for your academic life, for your financial life, for your life as a member of a family, as a head of the family, as a, you know, if you are not able to set your own goals, it becomes extremely difficult to set the external goals at university, at college, at workplace. So self-management is extremely important. As he mentioned, as you are trying to do self-management, you assess yourself, where am I strong? Where am I weak as a person? And therefore, I need support from other people. What are those external environments that give me opportunities to be better? And what are those external environments that are threats that I need to see how to turn into opportunities? I was chance to, be, to go to Japan for a few weeks in 2010 to learn how they do their, how they teach mathematics in a problem solving manner. And the first lecture we had, this professor told us, for us here in Japan, our philosophy of teaching maths is one task, one lesson. One task, one lesson. We were 13 Africans from seven countries. I was the only one from Uganda. The other ones were Tutu. And incidentally, I was the only lady. The others were men. And we all looked at each other. <laughs> and he noticed there was something wrong. So he asked, what's the problem? <laughs> and one of my colleagues, the men, uh, said, sir, professor, if we teach one task, one lesson, how will we ever complete the syllabus? Then he turned and he looked at us. And he said, finish the syllabus? Do you teach to finish the syllabus? Or you teach for your learners to learn? <sighs> we are all like, <gasps> what a rude shock. But as we went through the course, we discovered that you cannot even finish the, three, the one task. Because... Each step for them in solving any mathematical problem, each step you have to justify. How, why have you chosen that step? What efficiency does it bring into the system of you getting the solution? And so when you assess yourself, you are able to know, where am I strong? Where am I weak? 
And then you now say, if I'm weak at this, who among my colleagues is actually strong? And that leads us to my next, question, um, next point, which is collaboration. Collaboration. We just have to learn it. The time of having your exercise book and writing in it with part of it up like this, you know? You remember in the primary school when you didn't want people to copy you? Mm -hmm. You'd raise one part of the exercise book and then write so that these other people don't see what you're writing. I'm not saying that anybody should encourage copying and I know it's against our rules here. But what I'm saying is that we need as academicians, as adults now, to develop the, the capacity to collaborate. To develop the capacity to ask the why questions. Even when you are reading a textbook to, to, to teach, ask yourself the why. Why did this person propose like this? How will it translate into the lecture I'm going to give in view of the students that I teach and where they come from? When you ask yourself those questions and you collaborate with friends, then you are able to do much more than you would in your personal development through the different articles you write and the researches you make, but also in the output you give. How well are your students picked by the industry? What competencies do you help them to develop for the two years or three years that you have them here? But you cannot give what you don't have. So what does that mean? That we need now to train ourselves to develop competencies of delivery that will help our learners not just to learn for an exam, but to pick the competencies for life. I'm about to finish. The second, the third last point I thought I would reflect on was the issue of community engagement. Our communities are so rich that you can do 10 researches in, our, in the same community. We have so many problems in our communities that we can actually do and finish master's, PhD, and post in our communities. So the issue of community engagement is very, very critical. The issue for us to start looking at this university as now an icon that should be able to influence the community around us is very, very important. The community people know a lot that you don't know. Even those who didn't go to school, they have so much wealth of knowledge. But how do we engage them? How do we use what we get to improve their environment and their living situations? How relevant are our research outputs? <coughs> we now have a journal. How many of you have picked one item out of what you wrote in the journal to go and do something in the area that you researched in? <coughs> that takes us to community engagement. So, train yourselves, train your students to ask the why questions. <coughs> be willing to be challenged. If you are not willing to be challenged, you never learn. Be willing to be challenged. When people ask you questions, don't be angry. Try to find out, how come I was not able to pick this? And then get to them and say, so for you, what do you think? How can we move along? Um, on this area. Um, he, he brought out a number of, of, of quotes at the end, and mine I couldn't remember it very well, but I'll end with it. But just to say, friends, that the young people we have who are in our university and colleges and schools and others who will come are being educated for jobs that do not yet exist. They are being educated for jobs that do not yet exist. So giving them facts to cram is killing them. We have to train them with skills that will make them adaptable, that will make them able to learn for themselves. 
that will make them able to research and find solutions and answers so that wherever they go, they can quickly adapt and be relevant. And for us teachers, our relevance is measured by how relevant our outcomes are. And our outcomes are the learners that we teach and train. So um, um, I'll, I'll abbreviate this quotation, but it's very close to what our, our speaker ended with. Uh, it says that education is what remains when what you learnt in what is either school or university you learnt in school or college has all vanished. An educated person is not one with PhDs. <coughs> so may God bless you as you continue to do this work. This is very exciting. I want to congratulate the management for putting this up. I want to congratulate all of you who have written um, articles that you are going to share with us at some point, and let us continue to ask the questions why. Why are we taking tea at 11? What will happen if we don't take it? What impact does this have when we do? Why are we doing what we are doing? In your, in your department, in, your, in, your, in the course unit you handle, why am I handling it as I do? Otherwise, uh, people will just pick material from the people that did that long time ago and reproduce it, and you'd have done no work. In my first year at Makaya University, I was offering PCM and a diploma in education, and I loved both physics and chemistry equally. However, by that time, after means war and all that we've gone through, the physics lab equipment were not working. So every week we had a practical lesson to do. And we'd go in and you'd be at it for three hours and you'd really have no results to write. And I was already a saved person. I had a conscience. I, I, uh, others were doing what they called Xeroxing. They had material from people who were there 10 years ago, so they would Xerox them, leave them to the next generation. So they would Xerox, write the right, what should have been the right measurement, which you have not got, and get 9 out of 10, and, get, and I would be getting 4s. And I got frustrated. So at the end of the first year, I chose to go the chemistry route. I loved both in the same way, but maybe I would have done physics. So now we cannot afford to do that. If your children are Xeroxing, if your learners are Xeroxing, you schooling. The issue of Xeroxing at BSU is soon becoming history. We have now installed the plagiarism checker by a tiny tin. So any work at BSU, whether undergraduate research, whether postgraduate, Now in the program it is at 11, you know, and now it is 11. But earlier, I had told some officers, I said, we shall design another way of addressing that breakfast so that we can catch up with those time. So we are asking questions. We are trying to see how we can. We, we don't take things the usual way. Uh, let me take this opportunity and hopefully, prayerfully, I will try to be brief so that we redeem some time. Apologies for having begun late. Uh, I want to appreciate the university administration for organizing this. This is very critical and key. This is what makes a university. I want to appreciate the council for supporting this because this is really what universities should be about. In fact, I don't think every university does this 
Some universities, some time back, Abu Kasozi professor said, some universities are glorified secondary schools. Yeah, because glorified secondary schools when they don't involve in research and this kind of thing. I want to appreciate uh, the organizing team, which has made everything possible for us. I want to appreciate my dear wife, who has also this time accompanied me. <laughs> and she was a former lecturer here. And I thank God for her. She's now at MAST with Professor Kazova. And I appreciate she supports me very much. Even in my uh, research, which we shall present later on, uh, she was asking me questions and uh, assisting me here and there. You know, one of the interesting things, in the, especially in academia, especially in the modern academia, in our times, we used to, to really you die alone. But these days, you have these collaborations, which are very good. So I really want to appreciate her. Uh, and also for the last 20 years of marriage we have done, and we are going to speak on the topic of marriage hours later on. So I thank God. Fostering graduate employability and innovation. The speakers have touched on research, dissemination, importance of research. I decided to bring out the theme, the main theme, and to say some few points, and then we move on. I was looking at graduate employability and innovation as two sides of the same coin. Actually, there's someone who, who is going to address the topic of employability, and I think curriculum or something like that. But this is a very, very uh, pertinent theme for us as a university, very. Two sides of the same coin. Without innovativeness, we cannot expect to be employable. There must be something unique. Because like I said, some universities are glorified secondary school. Even that every graduate will find employment in the public sector. In the olden times, people will tell you, don't know whether maybe that's in the time of the Kagames, you would finish, you are assured of a job. There was no doubt, no question. But things have changed a lot. And the question is, what may we need to do? Some few things, probably, which you can remember. And one, I think, curriculum needs to be addressed. Madam Kedres has been addressing that also. Curriculum. We have been used to rote memory, cramming. That's why uh, the education, the Minister of Education now has come up with uh, the new curriculum. And we pray and hope it will work because kids were so used to rote memory, cramming. We need in universities to have curriculum that is designed in such a way that it will produce the kind of students that will be innovative, reflective, independent-minded, and who can use the head, the heart, and the hands. Very important. And that's why people are talking of IT. Uh, there's even a, the, the most recent word. What is it? What do they call it? Aha! AI. I don't know how far you people have gone. Some of us are getting old. We just try to catch up. It's not easy. We are hearing of AI, artificial intelligence. Now, that's the thing you people should be trying to uh, grapple with the fourth industrial revolution and those kind of things. So our curriculum, is it geared, tuned in those directions? We need to ask ourselves. I think still, Madame Kedres mentioned it, the kids we are training now, we need to train them for the future, not my grandchild now. What is going to study? Uh, we need to find a curriculum which will address their needs. And you need to be aware of what is happening in the world. For example, language, very key, Kiswahili. If you know Kiswahili, we are in the East African community. 
Chinese has come. The key for you who are still young, you might be in this university, you are doing BCom, study Swahili as a side subject. Jobs for East African community, who will take them? How can you take a job of East African community when you know only English? When I was a student at the University of Leeds, we, have, we had the East African Association, students of East African Association. The chairman, of course, ended up being a Ugandan. Then, what happens next? We have a function, and the guys start speaking in Kiswahili, the MC. He was from Tanzania. And then the Ugandans are saying, hello, what is happening? Hey, this is East Africa. Hey, they spoke in Kiswahili, and we were there watching. <laughs> so, you young people, look at the future. Very, very important. There are some things that are coming. But there is also co-curricular. Outside the curriculum, Professor Kazova has ended with a gold medal. You would say, what does that have to do with BSU? It has everything to do with BSU. You get it? Everything to do with BSU. Because you are coming here to be nurtured, to exploit your talent, and if you use it well, if the university didn't provide that facility, it would have missed out a lot on, on, on sports, or even if providing for some scholarships where possible. And that is very important. The recent university quiz, Barra University, one I watched to the end. Wow, this was so exciting. Actually, when I, used, when I was at UCU, I remember I was a dean, faculty of education. I was the coach for UCU. And at one time, we won the Zane Africa Challenge. It was so exciting. If you have a student who has a certificate for Africa Challenge, that one from the university, ah, my God. You're in there, the core curricular. What you get in class, yes, is enough. But beyond it, what do you have? Everybody has what you're going to get as a degree. So beyond it, employability, what are you going to have yeah, as an extra? You need to have it. Uh, moot competitions for the law students, very important. Moot is part of classwork also, professor. It's part of classwork, yes. But they also have moot competitions which they go for and whatever, trying to see how you can argue out cases. Very, very key. Uh, uh, very important things which eventually will prepare you for, for the future. Exhibitions. I love exhibitions, which normally BSU week, but I was told you are having national exhibitions. That's why we are not having exhibition. We pray and hope you win. I normally get so impressed with the exhibitions I see here. Uh, and I think at some point you really should come up, up there with the very best of the best. Not because you are mine, but when you see something good, it is good. <laughs> it is good when you see it. What is that extra bit? Those debates, very important. I've been having a discussion on exams. Uh, Madame Kedris has mentioned the exams. Look at some of these results we get from schools. For me, I love it. I do research on it. In fact, I want to work with the Department of Education on that research. We need to develop it. Because so far, I have some good articles, about five, which I published in papers on tracking performance of students in our secondary schools and primary schools. We launched here my book, which was published. By the way, I sent a message to Madame, is it Naomi, the librarian? I don't know whether those copies are there. There should be some copies. Uh, on the subject of performance, recently I wrote an article, almost one page, for New Vision. How many of you saw it? Do you give students uh, newspapers to read? They read, but I don't want to climb around. Schools which have been performed, and you know, these past results, they had, it's going to detail now, but at least it's good you know. This is because of, again, the system of exam and the rote memory. People can cram and pass. The other day there was a, a clip about students celebrating in a small school. 
here, around, around here. And there were nine students who got fours. Barra Junior with 258 kids who were taught extremely well from P1 Nasare. You only have one four. It is possible, but I saw these nine fours from this school. I listened to the clip. I listened to the headmaster's English language. I listened to the teacher who taught. I listened to the student who got a four and a one in English. Impossible. They, they, they are not connected. They are not connected. They are not connected. I met recently, I am a teacher of English language. Recently, I met a student I taught at Intari. He said, you know, when you came in the year 2000, you really helped me. I was planning for a nine. I had already gotten it. I knew the guy is so intelligent, so good. But he came from these rural schools. His English was not good. He said, you assisted me. I came up with a C4. Congratulations. But a D1 from this headmaster, I watch. But also how they do it, I don't know. To get to even a D1, these are miracles, you know? Anyway, the point is, look at some of these schools which don't produce those exceptionally good grades. Go and compete with them in the marketplace. You will not manage them, those students, from some of those schools, which you don't see on page one of the national newspapers. Why? because they have been equipped in many other sectors and fields, while others only have been given the, the, the what is it, the academic. So, we need to look at the curriculum and the co-curricular activities our students are involved in. I, I was so excited whenever I would go to exhibition. You meet a student doing law, and you find she is displaying, exhibiting, the making of briquettes. That is innovation. That is a, a wider perspective. For us here, when you were studying, in fact, for us, we suffered in our times. You would say for me, I want to be a, a, an ambassador. So I will read literature and <laughs> history. So when we go to do research, we suffered. Then we met with mathematics. And he said, what does mathematics have to do with religion? And now you are going, doing a PhD. You are expected to do graphs. You are do but I thought I had run away from this. You can't run away from it. That's the approach we need. So, holistic development. Values. Values, very important. That's why every other day, erratic performance. Look at the... Education department, where are you? Please come and do research on this subject. Say an explosive. There, actually, <laughs> there, there is recently I was asking for some data from some education officials. They refused to give it to me. And I know the reason. Because they know some schools which have been cheating, now they, I will get them from UNEP. They will give them to me. If not UNEP, from some other office. Even they are refusing to give me what? Data. Why? Because there is a problem. So, but this is also about values. So which kind of people are we going to have at the end of the line when their values are crooked, a problem? Let me get towards the end. So employability, we need to, and innovativeness, we need to think outside the box, as they used to say, that was an expression which is getting out of use. You know, we normally get expressions, they go. So, because innovation is about New ideas, another one for agriculture conference, 15th to 17th, these people culture, curriculum, agropreneurship, you hear? Agropreneurship, agriculture, which is linked to entrepreneurship. Learning as you earn model. <laughs> you don't wait to graduate, but learning as you earn, very interesting. So that is the way. Can, uh, you have those that can make graduates more likely to gain employment and be successful wherever they go. And one of the last bit of illustrations is, as a diocese, we normally do a lot of interviews. 
uh, Reverend Canon Ngaberano, when we still had North, uh, when we still had Northwest Ankole, which went South County, even the uh, BSU, the workers here are workers of Ankole Diocese. So all those institutions of ours, we have about, we used to have seven thousand, but now uh, I think we have about four thousand five hundred, with the reduced size of the diocese. So we we were one of the biggest employers. Uh, that's why the Revenue Authority was appreciating us the other day. The Diocese of Ankole, we pay 300 million in terms of pay as you earn to URA. That's why we were uh, big size. So, but the point is, interview. When you have interviews and you invite these young people to come in, era. So when a, a young person is well-dressed and whatever, but talk about the one who is very well-dressed, well composed, so someone can come in and you say human bias, but never judge a book by. So sometimes when people start talking, eh, number one, it's difficult to recover in such an interview. You tell a, a young person, okay, market yourself. Jobs of revival girls. He said, you know what? For me, I'm so involved in environmental protection. And I'm actually very ready to come with the tree plantings uh, once I'm given a job. You compete with that one, you can't. <laughs> For you, you are going to say he deceived us, but you can't compete with such a person. You can't. But of course, he also cannot say that unless he has been involved in environmental club where he is. Graduates can be by thinking through our curriculum, the other assisting things that assist our curriculum can end with, one of them said, when you want something which you have never heard, you want something you have never heard, it's about innovation. You have to do something you have never done. Extraordinary. But perhaps this one is better and easier. If opportunity doesn't knock, build a door. That is Milton Berry. If opportunity doesn't knock, build a door. So it calls for being extraordinary, extra effort, extra reflection to perfect whatever you are at so that you'd stand out of the crowd. That is only when you will be able to succeed where you go. Thank you so much. Uh, you take this opportunity to open this uh, research dissemination seminar officially, in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, thank you very much. I deserve another clap, you people. Yeah, thank you. Uh, according to the program, it would be break tea, but the word break has been struck off. In other words, we shall have tea without a break. Hold on. Reverend Mukundane, come and pray for the tea. And please don't stand up to go for tea. Reverend Mukunan and team will come to where you are seated, and then they will take you to have a cup of tea as you come back. Please don't line up for tea. Don't go there when you have not been told to go there. However good or however strong your appetite may be, please wait for Tim Mukundane to come and take you. Thank you so much, Dr. Milton Rangere, let me start. And uh, because other officials found us when we had started slightly, you'll allow me to recognize the presence of our US. Madam Anna is here. She came when the first presenter, actually, when the VC was giving his remark. Uh, the house is almost full. Uh, allow me to welcome Professor Norman. Norman is a professor of law. Um, our Director of Finance. Director of Finance, please, uh, you are welcome. Uh, we have um, our, our, our senior. <laughs> Wilbur Biamkama is going to take us through adoption of information communication technologies in the dissemination of agriculture information in Uganda, a case 
of Rwanda district, Mayuge district, and Mbarara city. Will Broad, you are welcome. Please, uh, presenters, give us your work only so that uh, we can prepare. Will Broad, you have the podium. Mama Alice, I was share, sharing and uh, sharing with colleagues that I had opportunity being mentored. Uh, we had the same breast through Professor Moshe. And uh, when she was still here, she wanted to host Moshe. And I think you can go on and host her for us, rather host, or host him for us, because if he's not too old to come. Yes, uh, Dr. Ranjire, consultations with Dr. Bahati as we continue. Good morning, everyone. All protocol observed. I'm called Ulbrod Biamukama. I'm a PhD student of Bishop Stewart University. And uh, I'm working on a project titled Adoption of ICT in the dissemination of agricultural information and dissemination. Uh, I'm using a case study of uh, Mayuge, Rwanda, and Mbarara City. And uh, as you can see on the screen, I'm being supervised by Associate Professor Businge Felix, then Dr. Rebecca Businge. And uh, As you can see, it's growing. Uh, agriculture has been a mainstay for most who actually help farmers access agriculture information in the 21st century. And of course, of the countries uh, uh, used a convergent par uh, research design and also approach that incorporates both the qualitative and the quantitative because uh, all of these uh, approaches support each other. And of course, the, uh, uh, the population, uh, the uh, study used, uh, uh, the sample size was 400, but of course randomly uh, selected 374 uh, 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 respondents. Then, of course, there are also uh, a lot of uh, a number of uh, ESCO procedures that were followed uh, in this study, as well as the data, the methods of data analysis, whereby the uh, SPSS demographics. But because of time, we shall not go through all these. And uh, so here, this is a summary of the findings, whereby in Mbarara, the majority of 85% of the respondents were found to be owning radios, televisions, mobile phones, and computers, as well as the 56 majority in Rwanda uh, also own the same tools, then also the 58% of the respondents in Mayoge owned the tools. So uh, this, is, uh, this shows the proportionate of the farmers uh, who used different types of ICT tools in a different 
study areas Rwanda, Mayuge, Barara and uh, and uh, uh, Rwanda, Mayuge and Barara. So you can continue. So this is the uh, the analysis of the factors, different factors that affect uh, the use and adoption of ICT tools in different areas. So this is a disaggregation of different areas of study areas. Okay, you can continue. So you can run. Okay. So in here. I also performed regression, and it is noted that in Mbarara, uh, the null hypothesis was uh, uh, rejected since the p-value was above the, thresh the conventional threshold of 0 0.05. Then the other two, the, uh, the, the, the NAR hypothesis uh, was rejected when uh, the p-values was around the uh, conventional threshold of 0 0.05, 0 0.05, okay, you can run through, run through, continue running through, because time is bad. And, uh, go through, time is bad, I want to finish up. Yeah, the last one. Continue, the last one. Okay, so this is uh, the model that was uh, performed using pass analysis with maximum uh, likelihood estimate that confirms that the model was fit for farmers to make generalizations and conclusions in the uh, dissemination of agriculture information. Do I have to save some other time? Okay. So this is the conclusion, and the, all this conclusion has been, the conclusions have been based on the findings, and uh, we find that uh, the farmers uh, had varying results in both different uh, study areas with different, of course, percentages, and of course also we found out that different factors were affecting farmers differently to have the access and adopt different ICTs. You can finish up. Okay. So I thank you because of time. Maybe we can. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry? Maybe you can run to the recommendations. Next. This I said I run to the recommendations. One minute. To the recommendation. Yeah, as he tries to push on, the recommendations is that the government should have uh, a greater interest in uh, trying to uh, build the capacity and train the farmers because this, some of these areas are located in hard to reach areas with issues of connectivity, issues to do with um, uh, high cost of data, and so on. Then also the issues to do with rural electrification and the intensification of solar power for farmers so that all these farmers can, because all these technologies work hand in hand with Thank the you. access to power. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does that have the clap? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Marija, I, like, I wish to make an, an announcement. I want to tell the members present in the plenary that uh, when you look at the book, if, you are, if, if your interest is in knowledge and perception of formal and informal caregivers, please go to the senior, the senior common room. If you are interested in child maltreatment and child protection services, also go to the, to the common room. If you are interested in teachers' attitudes towards inclusion of children in the street situations, and also in assessment of competitive of Shia collectors in the Shia nut value chain, please go to the common room. Thank you. Let's have another presentation. Thank Let you so much. Please stick to your 15 minutes.
Thank you so much. Uh, next, we shall have Milton Rita Nwavimpa. Uh, Nwavimpa is a former head of department economics and uh, is going to present to us does the quality of teaching have relationship with the employability of university graduates? Wavimpa, please. You are welcome. You have your 10 minutes to take us through your work. You gave me 10. Okay. I greet you in the name of Jesus. As you have heard, I'm Nwabimpa Milton. And uh, I'm a PhD student, and uh, I, my, my research is the quality of higher education and employability of graduates. But out of that, I have got one objective where I'm writing a paper, and it is the one now I'm presenting. And, uh, my objective, that one, it is uh, looking at quality of teaching, the relationship between quality of teaching and employability of graduates. Therefore, my question is, does the quality of the teaching have relationship with employability of graduates? As the... Uh, okay. We, we find that employability of graduates is a concern globally and uh, on national level in Uganda. We find that many graduates, many graduates after they have finished studying, some fail to get jobs Others get jobs, but they fail to retain them. And we find that he, almost 50% of all graduates in the East African region, it was reported by Walker, a in 2016, was saying that they are, they are not prepared for employment. And because of that, when they get employment, they don't retain. And we, in higher education institutions, higher education institutions in Uganda, they are also concerned. Because universities, as we had seen from the previous speakers, they are judged mainly on the output. And the universities are not meeting their expectations because we are expected that after you have trained people, they should be somewhere and they should excel. And in Uganda Vision 2040, it highlighted a significant challenge of having labor force that is under or unemployed due to lack of appropriate skills. And because of a lack of appropriate skills, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself, or from this research, we are trying to find those appropriate skills, how do they come about? Is it as a result of teaching? And uh, now I'm focusing the, on the quality of teaching. On the quality of teaching, we are looking at the quality of teaching by looking at the quality of staff. We look at the quality of assessment, the quality of learning environment, and the quality of teaching methods.
And uh, my research, uh, this research, we are concentrate. We are. It is governed by human capital theory. And uh, human capital theory, for it is saying that education enhances a person's skills level and provides economic benefits. And it is also seen that human capital education is an enabler of someone who is acquiring education to move from one level to another. And it is again saying that when you improve human capital effectiveness through trainings, education and knowledge and skills, it will enhance the performance. And here we are, where we are looking at the performance, we are looking at an individual if you have acquired a job, or if you are looking for a job, can you market yourself? Once you have got the job, can you retain it? And then in terms of standards of education, we are saying that standards of education in terms of teaching and learning, they are using National Council for Higher Education, they are looking at standards of education as a minimum requirement for the course of study. Do you, uh, they, in that way, they look at the design, the content, the duration, contact hours assessment, and then they go ahead to talk about the relevance of what is taught, the assessment, learning environment, and the teaching methods. And uh, as I had said that, our objective is on quality of teaching and employability of graduates. There we dro I developed a hypothesis where we are saying the quali quality of teaching has no significant relationship with the employability of graduates from selected universities in southwestern Uganda. And the alternative, we are saying that it has the significant effect. And here, when we talk of Southwestern, the selected universities, in this research selected Bara University of Science and Technology and Bishop Stewart University graduates. And the, the graduates, the one which I have, I have looked at, those who graduated from 2017 to 20. 19. And the, uh, the data, the data that we used, and the the, the design. Use the correlation survey design and uh, use the quantitative and qualitative research approaches. And the population, or oh, the where we got the info, where I got the information from, I concentrated on graduates, concentrated on graduates, employers, university lecturers. University administrators and here in the administrators considered deans, heads of departments, academic registrars, quality assurance officers, and then officers from National Council for Higher Education. And the data was uh, collected using questionnaires and interview guide and documentary review. Uh, as they are telling me the time, can now rush to the results. In terms of results, we, there was a correlation analysis. And I used the Pearson coefficients, and we calculated the strength and the direction 
slide 14. Okay, they may, not, they may not be easily seen, but in a correlation analysis, it was found that, oh, that quality of teaching has a significant relationship with employability of graduates, and the, the coefficient was 0.56. And then from the analysis on the, on the correlation, it was also established that among the dimensions, among the dimensions of quality of teaching, found that teaching methods, teaching methods were found to be insignificant in this study. And uh, we found that also Proper assessment, where you are including tests and examinations. Uh, and this information was got from the people I interviewed. They are always done well. They sometimes they call, the students get feedback from how they are doing and it helps them to improve their abilities, which help to also to improve the skills which will later lead to employ employability. And uh, one of the participants also said that when they are in teaching, there is a good environment that is provided where universities have facilities in place. And uh, the facilities, here we are looking at the lecture rooms, computer labs, and other things that are aiding learners to learn for the, on, uh, when they are given what to learn, and also they can learn for themselves. Okay, thank you. And uh, also, it was found that students some of the participants recommend, say that students are given opportunities for mentorship, but most of the, in the, the university, the mentorship program is not formal. Lecturers help to mentor, but it is not formalized. And in testing the hypothesis, we found that quality of teaching has a significant relationship with employability of graduates and, uh, and uh, we can conclude by saying that universities must ensure that good quality staff conducive learning environment and effective assessment should be encouraged and that is a recommendation and also students mentorship program should also be emphasized because those are the ones which can also lead to improving the abilities of learners thank you A lecturer and a student of economics, and uh, thank you for this. I request that as you present and you see me moving, keep your eye on me because I'm communicating something, and especially in terms of time. And uh, when you get done, uh, your chair is here. When you get done, you sit there because we want to interact with you. Uh, next. We have another presenter, and uh, this presenter is uh, Ho. Oh. 
now I organize myself so that uh, <laughs> you cannot simply say it the way you want it. This presenter is a right reverend, associate prophet, professor, Fred Sheldon Mwesuga. I'm lucky he was my dean. And I know he helped me when I had challenges with my supervisor. And the technique you used, I'm also using it. I'm also using it, I'm asking people to give me reports. And through that, I get the progress. So he's going to present to us um, exploring Christian lived experiences of Anglican Christians and longevity in marriage in Ankole Diocese. I am very sure one of the respondents is my dad. My dad is now 87 years, and uh, you see me, I'm now 57. So he's 56 years in marriage. I don't know what has kept him there. Professor, you are welcome. have a team, a team of uh, three, you need to come stand by here, and you need that to see, but meantime for me I can begin as they work on it. Thank you very much, uh, the chairman of this session. We have a topic before us. Yes, thank you. Exploring lived experiences of Anglican Christians and longevity in marriage in Ankole Diocese, a phenomenological comparative study. Uh, the research team is, as you can see it, not yet there, but we have, in addition to me, who is the principal investigator, we have Dr. Donna Asimire, then we have Dr. Johnson Atwine, Betram Namanya, recently uh, who qualified as a PhD candidate. Now we can put their PhD candidate. It is also a stage. And we had our editors, Meda Rigendo and Dr. Alice. We also had a research assistant because in the guidelines they give us, you need to have also a research assistant. So we try to be in line. And we want to appreciate Bishop Stewart University. They were able to fund us with some five million. It is what has enabled us to come up with this. Uh, presentation outline. We have the background. We may not have enough time today, as I'm seeing people running, but we shall even present at an other forums. We have the background to the study, the purpose, the problem statement, conceptual background, methodology, findings and discussion, conclusion, study contributions to the body of knowledge. And we designed it in such a way that each one will have a section to present, uh, not just me here. And this is a product of the team and not uh, me alone. The background, there is literature which talks about faith, religion, and spirituality, which is used as a cultural repertoire in enduring marriages. Several people have written. There is some literature about religion, about spirituality, and marriage, but most of the literature that is there is Western, Western world. And even when you interpret Christianity in Western concepts, it's very different from Christianity here. An example is that when you look at uh, marriage in the Western world, I was telling people I visited the US with Dr. Kessiga, the late, who was an acting vice chancellor here. You would meet an older person 
with his wife, you ask. You think they have been together like 30 years. When you ask, he says, this is my third wife. And those are the born again there. And those are the born again, by the way. So the concept is different. Those are the research. That's the research that has been done. So in the African, so in this one, putting God first, studying and applying the word of God, giving their life over to God, it's important to look at the concepts of marriage. And we also, some writers indicate, there is an indication that in African traditional setting, observing marital rights may lead to longevity in marriage among both born again and non-born again. Because even among the born again, you find they have some traditional elements within them. So you can't extricate the born again to say this is doing it because he's a born again, but he's doing it because he ha he's also part of culture. So it becomes a bit. This study was guided by the culture theory propounded by Anne Swindler, a theory that looks at religion as culture in the academic sense. And anyway, it makes sense because religion, even when you describe it, it looks at the values, the beliefs, uh, the, the, the different aspects of what makes Christians. It becomes a way of life, in other words, uh, in short. In 2022, the Dias Ankhore preliminary findings, we have this research document, uh, which was done, and we found that 200 couples had made 50 years and above in Ankhore. More than three quarters were born again. Balokole, and Balokole of Anglican Church, not other Balokole, very important. This study is about those Balokole. Problem statement, in brief, the background, I will not go into it because of the time, there are documents there which show the ideal that we should have. The Constitution of Uganda talks about the ideal, man and woman, rights, privileges, SDG uh, 16, talks about promoting peace and inclusion, uh, marriage institutions and others. However, some challenge mar marriages, uh, we have not used the, we, we, we corrected some slides. They should be the crime report of 2023. Uh, and actually later you may see the tape which I play, which you can play in your free time, of the 117 year old who killed his wife of 110. But the statistics of our region are very bad. Actually, Ruizi region, Mbarara, Isinjiro, Wampara, we are number one in Uganda in murder, even domestic violence. Number one. So if you see yourself surviving in a marriage, thank God. <laughs> number one, Ruizi region. So the problem is some marriages are strewn in intimate partner violence, and others end up in divorce. About 19.8% 19 of men, IPV, and 65% of women. That's the household survey. Uh, maybe the question is, little is known on the role spirituality contributes to longevity in marriage in Ankole. That's why we are trying to find out what does spirituality how does spirituality play out in marriages? Does it have any role it plays, positive or negative? So the study set out to establish the relationship between spirituality and marital bliss or happiness among Anglican Christians in Ankole Diocese. Purpose of the study, and meantime, Dr. Donna, you should be coming to continue with the conceptualization and the form. Purpose of the study, to explore how lived experiences of Anglican Christians contribute to sustainability or longevity in marriage, so as to contribute to marital bliss. And the research questions, to examine the lived spiritual experience of the born again and longevity, examine the lived, lived experiences of the non-born again, because we had the treatment group, the born again, and the control group, the non-born again, and we wanted to find out from both. Then three, to come up with the possible ways that can enhance marital bliss. And the research questions are in line with that. Can you please uh, 
quickly go to the conceptualization, and then the background statistics, and then Dr. Atwine will come on with Why you'll have like three minutes or two, I don't know. How many do we have? Okay. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Uh, we conceptualized the study uh, looking at the Anglican Christians in a form of those that are born again and the non-born again Christians and we are scoping it to only those that are in the East African revival uh, background. Then we also conceptualized longevity in marriage to reflect and scope out those that have been married for 50 years plus. If you read a study that was done by David Mullan, he looked at religiosity and how it endures marriage. Most of the studies conceptualize this uh, below five, uh, 50 years, 45, 20, 30, but we conceptualized it at 50 years plus, and also to establish and see if certain features reflect in their relationship. Re uh, features to do with communication, intimacy, and uh, how they respond to partners' behavior. Behaviors to do, say, conflicts, uh, maybe handling disagreements, and especially issues to do with the Christian values. How do they respond to each other's levels of adherence or commitment to faith and spirituality? So we believed and we trust that like other scholars have written, being born again has something to do with the way one communicates with a partner. It has something to do with the intimacy, the love and care. It has something to do with how you react or respond in case of disagreements, so as to foster and ensure that there is sustainability in the relationship that has been committed to under the biblical guidance. And that's why we're only even looking out for those that were in holy matrimony, not considering other types of marriage, because we know they are of different types. So that study, David Mullan studied about uh, religiosity and enduring marriages, and other scholars, including uh, Okrut 2002, they look at how religiosity has something to do with uh, enduring marriages. And that's how that study was conceptualized. I'll rush through the methods because of time, and we looked at phenomenological, most of you who have done research to do with the experiences, phenomenological was most appropriate and we looked at a comparative kind of study because we couldn't understand how do they, the born again and the non-born again, how are they different? We see them all 50 years in marriage. And we are interested in knowing what is this in particular that makes them all arrive at 50 years in marriage, yet one category is born again and it confesses, but the other is not. And that's how we arrived at using the comparative study to look at the two different groups and see the specific features that are in these two groups to know what makes them prosper and go up to that extra mile that most may have failed to reach. Then we also looked at those that were in salvation for 20 years. They will find very few that have reached 20 years in salvation, very few, not everyone. Of course, at data collection, there are those that would have withdrawn. You ask, are you still born again? We see you are born again. Are you still born again? The person says, ha, the other time when I lost my child, I developed misconceptions. So you'd leave out that. Would ensure we look at those that were 20 years in salvation at the point of collection, even when you're 50 years in marriage, for the case of those that are born again. And for those that were not born again, as long as you are 50 years in marriage, then you would be included. And of course, we used instruments, the interview guides for the um, archdeaconaries, for the parish priests, and also for the born again and the non-born again. But what made these instruments different? For the born again, for example, would ask, 
you will usually go for prayers. What does that mean to you when it comes to marriage? But for the non-born again, we would ask, we understand prayer is important, but what do you think happens if you don't pray? Then they would open up and tell us. So we would engage them using these interviews and being the priests and the archdeacons being the overall receivers of some of these issues we are part of this study. And we were approaching it with the interpretivism paradigm. I will not go through all that because of the principles, the hermeneutics principle, reflexivity, and ETC to interpret the perceptions. And finally, we used the content analysis to analyze data. Go to the next. This is the background of the characteristics. Go to the next. Yes, I want to concentrate on these findings. Um, one of the key findings. Take a few. Yes. Mm, one of the key findings is uh, about more likely to unite in case they separate. I want to read out this loudly. My dear, it's tricky, but I have seen the hand of God in my marriage. One time I had separated a bed with my wife, just over minor marital issues, and I started sleeping in our visitor's bedroom for two weeks. During that time, we had a mission week, and during the service, the preacher preached about husbands who mistreat their wives, and he called the congregation to repentance. I, although I did not walk to the altar, I got touched when I reached home, I asked my wife to forgive me, and I came back to our marital bed. If I was not born again, my marriage would be no more. I look at the experience of this person, the way he interprets the sessions that he was attending and the experience that he derived from the speech and the, 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 the preaching and the guidance from the session that he attended and his experience being used to decide or make a decision over his marital uh, relationship. And that is the intimacy we are talking about. And of course, when you look at the study which adopted the culture theory, that is a belief and it rhymes with the interpretivism paradigm, the hermeneutics. You look at how the literature talks about the different couples in different marriage background. All this contributes to the findings and making them more valid. So we recommend tolerance and reconciliation. There can be a difference, a positive difference eventually, but we want to ensure longevity. Finally, I want to read one. Uh, that's the objective one. Yes, I want to read one finding. I used to admire having sex with animals, and sometimes I could have sex with my own while grazing. My wife kept wondering what the problem was. I always denied her sex because I had no interest. My marriage was almost failing. I had a terrible spirit. One time I attended a session for only men at my church and the session leader gave us some assignment about a sex style. I had never thought about having sex. No. Ha 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 ha. I was just trying it on my wife, can you imagine? And it appeared sweet. I tried it again and again. Since then, I have never thought about having sex with an animal, except that I am now old. Oh, I'm not supposed to tell you this. Of course, she felt like, what have I said? But assuming this person wasn't born again. The animals would all not be. All animals, even yours. Yes. <laughs> Next. Yes, so this find, these findings are very important. Objective two. How many minutes? Two. <laughs> we go to the conclusion. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
While we look at the findings, we can look at now the findings of objective two, which looked at the lived experiences I of you nine. Do even three because in view okay. Just tick. Okay. What is important is that uh, also the non born again Christians, yeah. they had stayed 50 years and above in marriage. Mm. But the question is about the quality of life in that marriage. Yeah. We have already been told about a 110 year old man who killed the wife, 109 are choosing her of not fulfilling the conjugal obligations. So when we look there, we look at the long-lasting marital strain. They are there, but things are not all that good. There is a lot of strain, but they have also attained that. And next slide. The next slide. Okay, so uh, we also look at the recommendations, uh, also look at the findings from uh, the Nanibon again. Uh, but there is a lot of uh, things that are happening, but uh, the most important thing is that uh, most of them uh, had stayed for 50 years and above because of culture and because of not uh, uh, surely letting their cultures down. That's the main thing that I can talk about, the non born again. So the culture is the one that had made most of those non born again Christians to stay longer in marriage. And the recommendations, uh, those people are actually going through a lot, and we recommend pastoral visits, uh, which are very important in order to change the attitude. There is also need for prayer and deliverance among those people. Some of them are still worshiping their own gods. Maybe for, that, for the interest of that, can just read one, uh, one of the uh, verbatim quotations. Like I've told you, I feed the small god every day. He cannot allow me to discuss anything about it. At my age, society will laugh at me if I fail this marriage. So there is a lot of things that are happening and there is, there is need for prayer and violence. And also guidance and counseling sessions are very much paramount. Thank you. Conclusion, longevity in marriage among born again Anglican Christian marriages. The study concludes that longevity in marriage among born again Anglican Christians is characterized by happiness, satisfaction, peace, companionship, and harmony, unlike, unlike many in the control group. Longevity in marriage among the non-born again Anglican Christians, the study concludes, concludes that longevity in marriage among the non-born again Anglican Christians is largely characterized by frustration, unhappiness, dissatisfaction, and conflicts. Contribution to the study, we shall share with you the document you read on your own. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. You remember the Angkore culture of Mukuru Nagumari? So thank you so much and the team. You know, we have time. And uh, yes, announcement. If you check page two, another session is going on in the common room. So if you have interest in these topics, please go there. Uh, we are going to invite Dr. Rebecca Karewani. After she has presented, she will be backed up by the innovations team. Before the questions, we have innovations team. We feel when the owners and bosses of the university are here, they need to know what we are doing. So, innovations team, please get ready. Dr. Karwani, you are welcome. Actually, the, the name is Karwani, not me. Uh, she's going to take us through piloting problem-based learning in the teaching of agriculture using the biofertilizer challenge at Bishop Stewart University. I am happy. I taught you and you learned it. Thank you so much. You are welcome. Yeah, and if you are interested, when you read on page two, more, more presentations are going on next to the door in the staff common room. Please join.
join them. Read on page two of the program. Please join them. Those who are interested in education, teacher attitude, and child protection services. everyone. I'm sorry, I thought I was going to present using Okay, my name is Dr. Rebecca Kalivuani, the Faculty Dean, Agriculture, Environmental Science and Technology. But I'm here to present what we have been going through in the AgriScale project. I am the coordinator of AgriScale at BSU. AgriScale is one of those projects that is in the category of an action research project. And therefore, the way you collect data and the way it is conceptualized, it is in such a way that you implement the project activities as you collect your, your, your information, your lessons, any learnings, you, you, you go along as you implement the project. So in the AgriScale project, we did that and it was basically about problem-based learning. It also answers the question that uh, an earlier presenter put to us, does the quality of teaching affect the, 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 the graduates and their employability? Yes, like the findings show, he showed us, it does affect employability of the graduates. And this project was premised on answering that question, the hypothesis that actually the quality of teaching does affect um, the employability of the graduates. So in this project, or before I go to the project, um, I have a group, a team of authors with me who were members of the AgriScale team, and I will also explain them as we go along. They are authors, they are co-authors with me, but also they had some different roles to play in the, in the project. By way of introducing this piloting of PBL, I'll start with the introduction itself about the question of the employability of the graduates. It has become a global phenomenon, actually not in Uganda only, that we're asking ourselves how to better get our graduates to be employed. And this is where, this is where PBL comes in. The world needs graduates with competencies such as critical thinking, the ability to solve complex real world problems, communication, teamwork, self-directed learning, among others. So PBL, is a pedagogical approach to teaching and learning. Actually, this approach is not a new one. It was practiced, it has been practiced for several decades in the field of medicine. This is where those who are studying to become doctors are taken to, to do a ward round with their seniors during the time of study from, I think, second or third year, around there, they begin to go for ward rounds so that by the time they finish their five years of study, they, are, they know how to treat um, certain cases. They have already been exposed to these cases. So this is an approach that the world is now beginning to think that it can apply in all other fields, agriculture and all the others. 
So it is what the AgriScale project aimed to introduce to those who are teaching agriculture. And it is believed that it is an effective instructional approach. It has, in its characteristics, I'm already at characteristics, it has a connection with self-directed learning. It requires students to be active. They learn better when they are activated and motivated. It uses a problem to initiate focus and to motivate the learning of new concepts. In other words, students are required to solve a certain problem. It also prom promotes collaborative inter interaction. And this is why it may be a better approach to teaching than the conventional teaching. I want to take us through briefly the background of this ag uh, AgriScale project. AgriScale, the full title of this project is Innovative Learning and Co-Creation of Teaching Methodology for Scaling Entrepreneurship in Food and Agribusiness in Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa. So the acronym is AgriScale and much easier to, to remember. This has been a three-year project between 2020 and 2023. But because when we started in 2020, there was COVID and uh, lockdown, we were not able to achieve much. We were interacting with our partners, mainly online, and we were not able to, um, to, to do much of the activities. So we have received a no-cost extension up to March 2024. And just next week, we are going to close the project in one of the partner institutions in Kenya. This is a project that has been, that was worth over 900,000 euro, supported by the European Commission under the Erasmus Plus uh, program of the European Union. And down in that slide before that, the slide before, we have those are the partners, they are nine. Six from Sub-Saharan Africa and three from Europe. The first one, I don't know which hand you're looking at it, this side, is Egerton University. The next one is Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology, both in Kenya. In Uganda, we have two universities, BSU and Gulu. And then Zambia, we have University of Zambia and Mulungushi. In Europe, we have three partners, Alto University, University of Pavia. University of Pavia is in Italy. Alto University is in Finland. And then HAMC is the lead of this project. Among the activities that we've been able to implement, there were online trainings. They were mainly online because of COVID and they were facilitated by the lead, HAMC. At BSU, the training was facilitated by the Faculty of Education and Media Studies. Now, this was not the project design. The project design was that we are all trained by HAMC, and then we have the same uh, training, which we are then going to use to review selected programs and integrate PBL. What happened at BSU, we were, not able to, we were not able to complete the training by HAMC in 2021. We had a number of activities, overlapping semesters, and those who started the training fell out and we did not complete with HAMC. So at BSU, we decided that BSU, much as it started in, in 2004, we should not forget that this is an old teacher training college. And therefore, issues regarding pedagogical approaches should not be something new to us. So we engage the faculty of education to come and build the capacity of faculty of agriculture to take us through this thing that is called PBL. I must say, ladies and gentlemen, that by doing that, the consortium of partners has accepted our problem-solving skills as BSU. 
And so they were able to accept the way we did it. And uh, so we went on, we are on the same page with the rest of the project partners. After that, we were able to, again, being guided by the Faculty of Education, we were assisted to review four programs, BACAD, Climate Change, MARI, that is Agriculture and Rural Innovations, and PG Dari. After undergoing the, the training, we were supposed to review some programs. We could not review 100% of a program because we were just learning how to do it, but according to the regulations of National Council for Higher Education, we are, we are allowed to review at least 30% of an existing program, and that is what we did. We introduced PBL in at least 30% of that of those programs. And in the project design, we were then supposed to go out to pilot in the field what uh, PBL is all about. And this is where we have the activities called student challenges. So when we say in the title of this presentation, piloting PBL using the biofertilizer challenge. We are saying we went out to investigate something around biofertilizer um, using PBL. So briefly, the methodology of piloting that was used by not just us at, at BSU, but also with the partner institutions. We set out to identify a private sector company Remember, in the title of this project, there is scaling out entrepreneurship. The project was uh, the, the the project was focusing on improving employability of the agriculture graduates through entrepreneurship. So, how do you do that, and how do you use PBL to 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 enable the students? How do you use PBL to enable the students to be entrepreneur, entrepreneurial and then to be able to get themselves employed or to employ themselves? So we identified a private sector company. The company would provide a problem, a real problem that they are facing in that company. And then at the university, a team of students would be put together with some lecturers called mentors, and then they would begin to investigate using the PBL methodology. Now, the beauty with the project is that it enabled students from other universities to come and study with the university that has proposed the challenge or that activity. The biofertilizer challenge at BSU so before we go to the challenge, you will notice that there is a company, the challenge owner, and then a team of students, and then partners that joined, and then they came up with a solution, and that solution is supposed to be taken back to, to the challenge owner, the solution of that challenge. So the biofertilizer challenge, we identified a company known as Bold Energy Limited, as the challenge owner, and this is a company that produces biodigesters. So their question was, how do we improve the sales of biodigesters? That investigation was done by a team from Jomo Kenyatta, Gulu University, uh, Hamk University, and BSU. <laughs> You're not following the, but, but we have some pictures there of the, what, what happened. So that was basically what happened as we implemented the challenge, this one of the biofertilizer, but also in the other universities where our teams went. Last Saturday, a team came back from Zambia. Uh, they were investigating the challenge that was hosted by University of, of Zambia. Let me quickly go to the lessons that we have learned. It actually promotes critical thinking. It fosters deep understanding of the concepts and encourages higher order thinking skills. When the students get together, 
they are the ones who drive the agenda. They pick out the concepts that are related to the challenge. You may not necessarily be an agriculture student, although most of these were, but when the company that has been identified is in biodigesters, that is where you begin to learn about the energy industry, the biodigesters, how they work and how they produce bioslurry and how bioslurry then turns into biofertilizer. So you get the opportunity to explore the concepts around there, not necessarily in a structured manner like we conventionally have, a course outline that begins with topic one, topic two, topic three. In week eight, you have uh, mid-same tests. This is um, an approach that encourages the students to actively be engaged in the challenge. They have to think out how they're going to address the challenge, and the beauty with it is that it solves real life problems that have relevance, immediate relevance, to what is going on in the community, and in this case, with this private sector company. It promotes self-directed learning. In other words, the students have to work out their own timetable. They have to work out the areas that they are going to explore. And the lecturer or the mentor is simply a facilitator of that process. It encourages problem-solving skills. It, it, it imparts these abilities in the students. And it, is, it, is, it also promotes multidisciplinary learning. In one of the challenges, actually this one of the biofertilizer, we had the students of climate change at postgraduate level working together with the students of BACAD on the same challenge. So you'll find that the BACAD students who are undergraduates are able to pick data collection skills from there, how they're going to interview the farmers in the field, even when it's not on their timetable as yet that you're going to do research methods now. But because you're now interacting with students who have already seen it, if the problem requires you to, to go and pick data from the farmers, then you've got to develop the tools, you've got to have a way of talking to the farmers, you learn it at that point. Now, this, um, this project also had implications for adapting the curricula that we have to integrate PBL. For example, we need, to, uh, we need to think about the way we, uh, we, we, we develop these problems. The problems that can reduce ambiguity are actually produced by those who own the problems. So we need to address curricula in such a way that we can promote a way of getting these clear problem statements from those who own them. And then um, in order to integrate PBL, there is a bit of uh, time management that is required in order to effectively implement the, the challenge. It, it is a process that will take you at least six months, although we were able to do it really for piloting purposes. The students came together for just two weeks, and most of the time before that, they were planning online, but it is a process that will take a bit of time. And we need to develop in our curricula strategies for effective group collaboration and to get the students to know how to work as a team. We need to have curricula that support self-directed learning, and we also need to have methods to be able to assess this kind of approach or this kind of learning. And then eventually also we need to train and keep training um, members of faculty. You have in used all your time successfully. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Kalewani. And um, thank you so much. Uh, she's my former student in this 
And now this answers Dr. K. Dress's view. Are we going to finish the syllabus? So this is it. Now, we are done with the presentations, but we are going to ask the Innovation Center, Food Security Innovation Center, as I request the presenters to take their seats up here because we are going to interact with you. This is uh, Catherine and her son Katumba. We are giving them only five minutes to tell us what they are doing at the Innovation Center, courtesy of the VC. Thank you, the programmer. Yeah, I'm Shoncho Catherine, assisted by Mr. Katumba. We are working together in the Food Security Innovation Center, which is under uh, the Innovation Center of BSU, uh, under, the, under Professor Gashom Atkunda, assisted by Dr. Johnson, and with other colleagues like Mr. Ran Dr. Wanjere Milton, and supporters, our US, our AR, they have all been in support of this. I thank you. So the main product that we are showing here is a product which is called WeaverMed. WeaverMed is a product for management of weevils in maize and beans. Because we realize that most of the produce out there, the beans, the, the, the maize, are managed by a certain compound called aluminum phosphide which they tie in a cloth and they put in, and it pours actually into our produce. When we are going to eat, we actually ingest some of these chemicals unknowingly. And we know that many a times some of these, some of our produce has been denied from getting out of the country because of these chemicals and the residues. So because of that, we came up with this product for management of weevil so that we would have safe food. It's one thing to have quantities, but it's another thing to have quality of food. So the quality of food will determine the quality of life we are going to live. And that's why I'm saying we need to go organic, have food that is safe for humans. And in that regard, we are not just looking at only humans because our innovation center is aimed at having a one health approach, whereby we need to see is our environment safe and how about the food we are eating and where are we getting the food from, from the environment, the animals, the plants, and then we shall have whole life whole health. And so if we manage the weavers and, many, and with other innovations that are yet to come, then we shall have managed the environment. Then we have another product, Fulkov. This is also one of the products that has also been tested. Like I told you, this has been tested experimentally, and I'm already doing research on it. So this is the product of my research, and I'm yet to do the phytochemistry about this. So this has also been given to uh, uh, the population's communities have used it full cough for management of cough, persistent cough, and so on. And uh, many people even here have used it, including Dr. Valja, he is a testimony. Uh, Professor Gashom has used it. Uh, Madam U.S. has used it. And many others here have used it. Very effective. And my family, this is now a common remedy for us, even after the other medicines have failed, the bacterial club, which, are, which, are, which we assume to be very strong but this has proved to be very strong in the management. Uh, we have uh, tick side. The last time I presented, I talked about uh, management of ticks also here. I've not been seated, though I've not yet come up with a comprehensive, uh, comprehensive uh, innovation about it, but I'm still working. Uh, but, but this, I have used it in vitro uh, on ticks that I have, in, uh, that I have placed in cotton wool, and after using it, I have been able to realize about 70% mortality of ticks which have been embedded in cotton wool after three hours. And after 24 hours, 100% mortality of the ticks have been realized. For two species particularly, appendiculatus and the bufilus for this particular product, but which is still a prototype and we are still moving on with it. But the problem is that the production of this is very expensive. So I don't know with the communities that we have in Uganda how possible we can make it achieve, uh, affordable. That is another question now. Schemocide is another product that we have for management of uh, wounds, skin infections in animals. Uh, I have used it on goats. Uh, this other common disease known as Ebenwanwa. 
And the, for actually, my goods I no longer buy those other chemicals from, from shops because this one is very effective in that management. Foot rot in goats have also, I have also managed, and all the other skin infections, and also tick bites. Actually, for tick bites, this and this are also effective. I, uh, for those who are farmers here, you understand what a tick bite means. Because, you know, after the tick, actually, it has even gone off, but still there is a wound that remains that is so itching. So that one, these two can be able to work. So the last product we have here is Tagimol, which is also for management of infections in chicken. Uh, those chicken that have lost moral and are able to eat, not able to move, this also works by, you just put some sample in little water and then you feed. So you realize that most of these, the compounds that, I have, that we have used here, they are, they are, there is a common compound. And that, those common compounds are called terpenoids in chemistry. So the terpenoids are present in most of the plants that I have used here. It's a common, one of the common compounds here. And it means that these, com these compounds are present in several of the herbs. So some of them may be having, some of them may not be having, but this is just a common group of compounds present. So meaning that with further investigations, then we shall have uh, medicines, natural medicines, because we believe that nature heals. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just in a minute, I'll start by thanking. In, 20, in 2022, I was the only Ugandan beneficiary of the forum, Regional Universities Forum. So I got my award from Zimbabwe. When I came, quickly I was called for a meeting for those that had gone to Zimbabwe. I was called like today in the evening, the meeting was the following day. I seriously, quickly wrote a project that was a food security innovation center, which I presented in a meeting. In the same week, I was introduced to Professor Kenneth Kagame at Akasha Hotel. I presented the project. If it is of recent, it was given a platform by Professor Gershom, our university, our, our chancellor. So this is a food security innovation center in line of one health, that is animal health, environmental health, and human health. So we intend to interact with the students, that is student skills, even staff, but also indigenous knowledge transfer with the community. At the end of the day, we have going to be food insecure. Thank you so much. I'm Don James Katumba. Lastly, these products have not yet been certified by the regulatory bodies, and it is very vital that it is done. So I hope in the next, like, six months, the, these two or three shall be registered. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, these people deserve more clapping. Yes. This is real innovation at BSU. Catherine is a staff, the Department of Science Education, Faculty of Education. I have to mention that. I have to mention that, yes. And uh, also, Katumba is our product in the Faculty of Education. We need another club, for sure. And Mama, you know Katumba. You taught him very well. I will request the presenters to take your seats. So one of you, you will pick one. Pick one, and I will need another chair because Catherine, you will also have one here who will answer. Uh, Katumba, bring that chair. Yes, please. Uh, I will please, please take the seats. Yes. As uh, they take seats, Kalugami's view and Dr. Kedris's view now have, uh, have met the agreement that the way to go is the problem solving way of learning. And this was used by the indigenous education. In indigenous education, there was no written syllabus. Now, we are going to interact. We are going to interact with these brains. So be free. Uh, we are going, yes. Yes, please, do. 
Yeah, thank you very much. I have a comment for each. One, we brought, I, I'll just talk, uh, we brought, uh, when you look at your conceptual framework and where the arrow of the intervening variable is on the conceptual framework, uh, you need to, to look at your, that arrow of intervening variable. You talked about overpopulation, I mean a sample size of 400. We didn't, we didn't know how you got it and where, what's the population. Uh, then Milton, I don't know if this theory was only for your paper or this theory is for your, for your uh, PhD research. Does it mean that your study is guided by only one theory and why? Then also uh, the two, Wilbrod and Milton, since you are a PhD student, this is a learning environment. You concentrate on reading and I indicate that someone may doubt if the work is yours. Because this is a presentation. The third one, uh, the, the, the team of the right level and associate professor and team, I have to commend you for coming up with that, uh, with that study. But I don't know someone who, who did a sampling for you in Isinjiro. In Isinjiro, there is a, a Isinjiro Masha Church of Uganda in particular. There is a gentleman who is 100 years old. His wife is 90 years old. They are Barokore, and they have been, been married for 75 years. I don't see that person anywhere. That person, if you can interact with that person, is going to enrich your study. He's a Molokole. By the time I was born, I found him a Molokole. And when I was reading through your book, there is only one person older than him in marriage. And he has been married for 73 years. And in this book, the, the, the person who has been married for, ma for many years is 75 years only. Then, then on the conceptual framework, I was looking at the conceptual framework, I realized there, are, is some, uh, there should be an intervention. Why do they stay together? What intervention is there? Being born again does not guarantee staying in marriage for long. Because we have cases in Uganda where being born again have, uh, have not lived that experience. Where church leaders have not that, that, that experience. A case study is Western Kore. Recently in Western Kore, we have seen it. Whatever from a clergy. Yeah, one, yeah, two, one. But, uh, but uh, in research, we, 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 we don't take it lightly. That is a person who has possibly come out. So there's a need for an intervention, an intervening variable. Then to, to Karibugami, I uh, thank you. We want to see it in your, uh, in, in your faculty. And, and Catherine, for you, you come to our offices. We shall plan to see that National Bureau of Standards give us a logo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we want you to be brief and to the point. Otherwise, we are going to take more time. Professor. Yeah, thank you for the presenters. They were very good presentations, but I have comments, one from Will, general comments first. It's better when you are presenting your results. We are interested in the results, usually, and try to repackage it according to the objectives. Uh, but I noted you wrote a lot on the background methodologies. We are interested in the results, even when you are coming up with recommendations, that's what we need. Now to Wilbred Jamukama, when you say adoption of information community technologies, I had wanted you to support your results. In other words, once you adopt this communication, different types of communication, what are you getting in terms of uh, uh, agriculture information? What is its impact of that information in terms of numbers? It didn't come out clear according to me. Now for Milton Beta, yes, thanks. Does the bit of the teaching of relationship with employability, I would also have expected the measures to put some numbers to support the different uh, teaching, uh, part of teaching, what are they contributing to sort of being, uh, uh, employment or unemployment, whichever you want to do. Then for, uh, for the bishop, I liked the teamwork. The people who presented, all of them, you could see they were informed about the, 
the results, the project, or their study. You know, sometimes you have got people, team, they have listed them, but there's nothing they can offer. And I like that way of approach. For Kalibana, thank you for the presentation. Again, my interest, problem-based learning, PBL, and by fertilizer challenges. Again, you need, probably, you had a short time, but I would also have loved the specificness of your results. What does PBL contribute as far as marketing or even selling these products? Thank you. Thank you. You, you are going to take note. Now I'm going to receive, like this, Dr. Kedres, my student, Professor Norman, and yes, head of department, a business, and Dr. Benon, in this order. Take note, after this, we shall respond. Okay? Thank you very much. For, for the good work you've done, just a few areas which I would be happy if clarified. From the first one on ICT in agriculture, sorry I didn't write your name, I apologize. It wasn't clear, I know you had very short time, but it wasn't clear who generates this information, how is it supposed to be disseminated, what language, considering the kind of farmers you may have interacted with. What motivated you to look at this in particular? Um, in your background, are there methods that were used before ICT came for disseminating such information? And therefore, are you looking at the relationship between the two? Or are you exclusively looking at ICT? So I thought I needed something there. Um, the teacher quality and employability. Your conclusion had a bit of, um, hmm. you, you, you conclude that the, the the teaching, the teaching affects the employability, but you had mentioned that the teaching methods were insignificant. Now, from where I sit, teaching is really about pedagogy. It's about the teaching methods, the delivery, because learning comes out as a result of the methodology. So I wasn't sure how the two could be different. And then, um, uh, Bishop, uh, thank you very much. I read the, the, the abstract, <laughs> and there was the, the, the statement that even for the Walukwere, there was a bit of contribution from cultural rights. Maybe we shall look for another, another word. Maybe we are looking at the positive cultural values or something, but the way it came out, I thought, hmm, this one needs to be looked at. And finally, um, the agriculture, uh, this new innovation, it's a very exciting one, and especially the collaboration between the faculty, or is it called the faculty, with education. Because this is one university, and so every resource available, I'm glad that you are able to go to education, learn how to do it, and then be able to be able to apply. I uh, wanted to ask lessons learned, but you have mentioned it already. Thank you very much. Sorry, Dr. Marije, but I thought I would just come in briefly and then I allow the microphone to go that side. Thank you for that. And um, I'm also agreeing with the rest of the members in appreciating the presentations that were made here. And I thank you all for the effort put in. So on, I also did not take the name, but was looking at agriculture and ICT. And I was looking at wondering why, what interested you to look at Mayuge, Mbalala, and Rwanda. Can we assume other areas are okay, or there was no information in those particular areas? So I was interested in that. And looking at those three districts, I would imagine the population is big. So why was the target population, and how did you, what was the sample size that you used that would give you effective results? I thought I would get more information on that. And of course, why Rwanda and what determined the size that you used since you seem to have a big area of the three districts in those areas. And then also on um, 
I think Milton uh, would have loved to know what is quality. How can you define quality? Because one would say quality is elusive. So I think it would be better to be so specific on what you mean. And of course, with that, it would bring out the quality indicators in teaching. What is it that you are basing your study on? And I think that would bring out your study so clear. So, and of course, you are looking at teaching. But I was also wondering who determines what to teach? Because I may be in the classroom as a teacher, but I may be, not be the final person. I teach what is provided. And I thought that would also uh, come out to support your findings in that direction. So what is quality teaching? Because you are talking of teaching methods, but what is quality teaching? Is it incorporating everything I think that comes in my mind as a teacher, or there are some particular areas that you need to look at that will give you specific findings that would be for your study. Yeah, I think I will leave at that. And then, of course, with Christian, uh, Christian longevity, I was looking at the gap. What is that gap that this study is going to bridge? Thank you very much. Uh, perhaps I stand. Uh, I would like to comment foremost on the presentation by Uri Broad Biamkama on ICT, the use of ICT in agriculture. And specifically, I want to go to your objectives. Unfortunately, I, would ha I don't seem to have the objectives project. being let down, okay. I would have loved to have a look at the objectives. One, in objective one, you want to determine. Then in objective two, you want to find out. Finding out is preliminary. I would have hoped that you'd find out first before you determine. And the way you order your objectives or organize them matters in writing a, a research project. You cannot determine what you don't know. And in which case, I suggested that would be better to swap those two objectives. Begin by finding out, then you can determine on the basis of what you have found out. That was one comment. Then number two, in all of your presentations, I didn't hear any one of you talk about the law of law. And since law determines policy or directs policy, surely there would be a policy framework that you should have talked about, especially the role of ICT in agriculture. How can you harness ICT in the absence of a robust policy or a policy to direct the relationship between those two? And therefore, the law cannot be left out in all fairness. And in which case, Perhaps your third, fourth objective should have been the law of law and how it helps to direct policy and agriculture and ICT. I presume those are the few. Eh, then lastly, the innovators. For a drug to be certified, apparently your drugs have not yet been certified. They have to go through certain rigorous testing. Toxicity, safety, eff eff how efficacy, efficacious it is, efficacious it is. I don't know whether the tests that you have carried out have been rigorous enough on the goats, on the ticks. Has it been rigorous enough? Will it pass the test to be certified? I presume you get to do all that uh, before you submit your products for certification. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I am a visitor here for the uh, BSU week, but I'm glad to be part of this dissemination. Mine goes to uh, Dr. Kaliwani. While this might not have been your focus of study, but I am wondering 
whether we are not going to face challenges in trying to introduce problem-based learning at university level while there are so many gaps from the start of our education system. Even when there is, uh, even when there is an initiative by the Ministry of Education to begin with all level, right now the students that are going to senior five will go back to the same system uh, according to the announcement of the minister what are you how are you intending to ensure that this methodology is well received at an older age when it has not started this early. Finally, for all the presentations, I believe that uh, PowerPoint presentations can be made better if we do not try to pack everything in the presentation and simply, I think I appreciated the bishop uh, for having a different place where he could follow his presentation as the technical people try to follow after him. Thank you. Thank you, the presenters. Uh, some other questions that I had that have been asked, some I'm not going to repeat. The remaining questions are going to Mr. Milton, uh, quality, of quality of teaching versus employability. So, and in your uh, sampling, the population you had graduates, I don't know how you trace to graduates. I have not seen the, the, the organizations that are employing those graduates. Hopefully, hopefully they, they, they were supposed to be there because they are the ones uh, employing the, the graduates. Because there you would, do, you would do trace, I mean, you would do draw the, the recommendations, what they are expecting from the graduates, from the, the, the students. So there you would draw the recommendations from what they have told you. And why uh, looking at two institutions yet in the Western, we have many institutions. Why two, the Bishop Stewart and, and Must? Why not others? And also in your analysis, you, have, you are looking at a relationship and you've used Pearson correlation and I thought it would be better also to, uh, to use the recreation analysis because it is not only teaching, quite of teaching that would influence or affect the employability of graduates. And another question was going to Dr. Donna, but Dr. Milton has already asked that it was regarding to intervening variable. That I was also thinking about it. Thank you. I'm Humza Benun in the Department of Business and Entrepreneurship. Uh, I want to thank the members for really your presentations, but some few reservations so that I add in weight to improve the work. Just a compliment sometimes. I, I will start with uh, the first presenter of adoption of IC technology. Uh, you really mentioned a lot, but the objectives as already mentioned were not really matching your conceptualization and that one also affected the, the findings. And in the findings still, when you went to regression results, maybe this is something that I should really go over across all the candidates, all the presenters. You said factors affecting uh, agriculture. 
and you assume these were regressional results. When we talk of regressional results, we mean the factors that influence the factors that influence the happening of the DV. In other words, the happening of agriculture. How should people adopt those uh, technologies of ICT? But not factors affecting. There you will be distorting the whole study. And uh, uh, on the present of quality of teaching and employability, I really also thank you so much. But I would really love so much. You see, you concentrated on the correlations. Those are not the findings. Those are not the findings. You establish the relationship of the variables so that you fulfill the first assumption to go regression. So the regression results are the ones that give us the findings. The correlation is just the first assumption for someone to say, I'm going regression. Without regression results, no findings at all. And on the same point, I would like also to operationalize the concept of employability. The employability, uh, fortunately, the Right Reverend Dr. Sheldon had already tried to put, make it across. I don't know whether there was a collaboration there. And uh, he had really already detailed it. You see, employability constitutes adaptability as well as career identity and at the same time attitude. So when you go for research, either you should have shown us the transformation, you transform the variable from the other dimensions or constructs so that you, form, you make it one as an employability. Without operationalizing it, then there is no way you can predict employability. And I would love so much really to capture that element. It will make it more successful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I will start with the will brought. And uh, uh, you, you just took us, just displayed the conceptual framework. And I, we ex I expected you to really show the relationship briefly between the independent and dependent variables, how they link to each other. And if there is any intervening variable, you also explain it to us how it influences the relationship between those two variables. Then you also didn't uh, bring out any paradigm. We expect you to bring out a philosophical orientation of, of your study. Briefly, at least you would just have a feel of that. Then when it came to uh, uh, results, you didn't really show that you were there in the field. We would like you to have brought out or show us that you were in the field there, taking us there whether you interacted with some people, some respondents, at least we need to see that you were in the field. So uh, you really uh, uh, took, uh, presented your results and came out of it without even knowing that you were presenting results. Then with the, uh, Milton, uh, I also didn't get your philosophical orientation and the paradigm was not presented and uh, I didn't see uh, you also taking, at, at some point you would say I did this, then at another point I would, uh, you would bring uh, as if you were many, we did this. So I don't know whether it was a group work, you did it as a group or the team, whether you went with your uh, assi research assistants, that's what you are trying to tell us, but it did not come out uh, clearly. You're Take us there and we feel that uh, you, you went there. Yeah, then those of longevity, uh, yes, you took us to the field, you, how you were interacting with the respondents. You, it can tell us, it can show that you really uh, went there. Maybe if, what could be one of the findings, the special one you would feel uh, uh, really created was so, uh, came out uh, and uh, uh, that has never been done by any any study because you are trying to compare uh, your studies with some other scholars. What really uh, the finding that came out 
and it has never been uh, done and uh, you do share it with us. Then to, to the innovators, yeah, uh, now food security, innovation is up. I know one of you participated in a, at a national level, uh, presentations, competitions, and also how did you fare from there, much as you had uh, limited time. Uh, but how are you feeling and what is your future, your future plan? Thank you. Thank you, VC. Thank you, all of you. And now I will begin from, uh, from here. If there is a question that you need to respond to, please start. And we go like this. And I think what supplies the donor is that thing of versatility. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the first comment was about uh, certifying before use. But uh, also, as we inquired, you cannot take a product for certification before you know that it is effective. So we first carry out efficacy studies. And like I said, most of these products, we have been testing them in vitro. And maybe after that, in the laboratory, then we are giving them somehow, after testing their effectiveness in the laboratory and their safety, then we go into the field, giving them to particular people. We are not selling. And they are not, these products are not even on the market. You can't even go to any farmers and you find them because they are not yet satisfy, certified. But then at, at this point, three products now are ready and they can now go through the processing. Thank you. Then another thing concerning the science innovation, uh, the science week, uh, I'm very grateful for to BSU uh, management because last year in November, they facilitated us to go to the National Science Week where we took these products for presentation. And the, especially when it came to this, the first product I talked about, Weaver made, it was uh, people are more interested in this product. They wanted to hear more about it. Because like everyone is, we are tired of using chemicals in our food. If this innovation can, 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 get, can, 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 can be effective, then we shall be safe. So actually, many people were like, go and, and they certify these products. Actually, this product is supposed to go through MAIF, not, not, not NDA. It's only a fork of the, the human medicine, which is supposed to go through NDA. So from there, we started working so hard, and that's why we are coming up with this center here, which is going to be a, a springboard for us to take these products in advance. So we appreciate the management for taking us through. And we promise to do our best under this. Thank you. Go on. Next. Two minutes each. Uh, thank you so Professor, much. Professor, excuse me. Professor, we had thought of launching the book after this, before we go for lunch. Yes? Oh, okay. All right. All right. Go thank on. Thank you so much. I'll talk about the future of the Food Security Innovation Center. Of recent, we released our call inviting for innovations and was open for students, staff, and the community. As we talk, we've got over 20 innovations registered with us, and of which we intend to organize the Student Enterprise Fund, the Staff Skills Development Fund, and also the Indigenous Knowledge Transfer Fund, and of which, at the end of the day, we want to have these students graduating not only with the degrees, but with the projects, innovations, products, and services. So that at the end of the day, we have Africa feeding itself because agriculture is the backbone of Uganda. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe I need to start with the first person who commented. He was talking about the conceptual framework, which actually I'm going to, he was talking about the arrows that are directed to the DV. That one, I'm going to work on it. Then the second one uh, was talking about the population. Uh, uh, this population, because now this study uh, involved, involved the multi-stage sampling and uh, in some size calculation, determination, uh, I used Yaman 1967 to arrive to 400 
respondents uh, right off from the total sample size of the uh, two uh, three study areas. Then um, I uh, uh, randomly selected uh, the 400 respondents. Then when the questionnaires were distributed, the response rate came at uh, 94%, which made to a total of 374 respondents. Uh, then another one was asking about uh, what is the maybe the end product of adoption of ICT. Of course, when these uh, ICT different ICT tools are adopted by different uh, smallholder farmers, there will be an increase in productivity because they will be able to effectively and at ease get access to uh, a number of services, planting, uh, advice, then issues to do with marketing, issues to do with weather forecast. It is it's, there are a number of um, uh, extension services that will be uh, easily gotten from the uh, adoption, uh, uh, leading to increased production. Then, of course, another one was asking what other methods or criteria that was there before the introduction of ICT. There has been the, uh, different conventional methods of delivering agricultural information to different farmers, including the field visits, farmer to farmer, all those practices. And uh, of course, when this ICT is adopted, there is no need of going to the field. If you're a service provider, extension service provider, you can basically use your phone, go on TV, go on radio, so that there is a wide coverage, scope of uh, coverage within the shortest period of time. Then, another one was talking about why the interest in different areas. These are different geographical regions with uh, 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 different agricultural geographical regions. And uh, the reason for Mayuge is that the government of Uganda under the Minister of uh, ICT has uh, always uh, uh, put the Rural Development Communications Fund working with farmers. And this one helps farmers to acquire gadgets in terms of uh, capacity building. And of course, from Barara, it is an urbanized uh, area with uh, agricultural setting. And uh, of course, for Rwanda, it is a, a rural agricultural area. And this was basically all about uh, a comparative uh, study. Then the issues to do with policy, Digital vision has been talked about, etc., etc., and of course also the African Union agenda. Then, uh, lastly, uh, is the comment from VC, which talks about uh, like the interaction with farmers. I had no time enough time to talk about the qualitative uh, analysis that talks about how these other uh, key informant informants were delivering and giving us aspects. To do Thank you so things. much. Uh, Middleton. Thank you. Uh, I thank you for the comments and the questions raised as the, as the, the heading was saying, below the heading I put there that is paper for publication. It is ongoing, and uh, what you have given me, most of the things are the ones to help me to improve it. And uh, there was a question on regression analysis. Regression, I have it there, but uh, because of time I, I, I did not present, but now I have seen that uh, other than uh, taking time on correlation, I would have rushed to, to regression and uh, also on the theory, I had two theories, human capital theory and signaling theory. 
and the signaling theory is the one that is showing the employers or it is giving a sign to the one who is employing because the, the graduate will come with a paper and the paper is a signal to employer as a result of what has been written on the paper. And on other issues, they are for improvement. I'm going to use them to improve the paper. Then it comes up very well. Thank you very the much. The concept of quality, not someone was interest, interested in this. What do you mean by quality? Okay, quality is measured differently by different people. And in terms of the teaching, we are, as we are looking at the delivery, has it come up well? And the, the measure for quality in teaching, usually it is the outcome. That's how I can phrase it. Right, Dr. Kalwani. Thank you very much. I wish to thank members for their comments and contributions. I start with Dr. Kedres, who appreciated the, our collaboration between the Faculty of Education, building capacity in the Faculty of Agriculture. Thank you very much. Um, then uh, a professor who was um, concerned about objectives across the board for this particular presentation, yeah, the, the objectives perhaps were not highlighted, but they were um, they are in the presentation, and also um, I, I mainly concentrated on the activities. One, the first objective was to build the capacity of the of the faculty, which we did, and that is where faculty of education came in. Two, we were supposed to review selected programs, and I highlighted the programs. And thirdly, to pilot the, the PBL methodology, which we did in these activities, which we called the student challenges. There was, um, yeah, the same professor was also concerned about the relevance of, of or rather the contribution of PBL. The contribution uh, is highlighted in the presentation, but perhaps I can pick out one um, one major contribution here is that PBL enables us to solve community problems in the, in the real world and also in real time. Because these problems are generated by the community or as in AgriScale, generated by a private sector company. So you work out or you investigate the challenge and then you take back the solution and it is able to help the that company. Unlike many of the research reports that we have in the library, and I don't know when we open them to get the solutions from there and take them back to the community, this, this particular approach will, by way of its design, you're supposed to take back the, 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 the solution to the challenge owner, the one that we call the challenge owner. And then someone was concerned about uh, us having PBL at the university, when the lower levels of education have not uh, fully adapted this, I think that it's not a big threat because the Ministry of Education has already initiated what is called the new curriculum and, uh, and there is a lot of similarity between the new curriculum and this PBL approach. So what we are doing at the university is to get ourselves ready to, to, to admit and to take on the students who will be coming out of the new curriculum. For them, they are already being able to, to do their own research. They are able to, um, to do critical thinking. Now, if we do not change our way of teaching at this point in time, these are young people who are going to outwit us because they'll find us still using our yellow notes and we, we think they are, they, are, they are too clever and therefore we start getting annoyed with them. So by introducing PBL at this point in time, we are getting ready for those who are now getting into the new curriculum and we'll be able to handle them better. Thank you very much. Dr. Donna. 
Behind you, you there is a big team. Pardon? Behind you as you as you answer. Ah, you don't look behind. Behind you there is a big team. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I want to appreciate all those that raised positive and suggestions that are going to support the improvement of our findings and I want to first of all bring out issues that were raised by Professor Norman. Professor Norman talks about policy framework. You will go on to guide us but I'll quickly tell you what we have considered for this study. In the first place we are looking at the sustainable development goal 16 which talks about justice and peaceful institutions where marriage is one of them. We are also looking at the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda, you are better in that, of 1995. Article 31 as amended, which talks about an adult person uh, at the age of 18, man and woman who has a right to marry, live in peace and in harmony with each other, and also Minister of Gender, uh, Labor and Social Development that talks about issues to do with gender, respecting each, diff uh, each gender category within a household. That is to do with the policy framework that we have considered, which caters the ideal part of this study. The other person was uh, Dr. Alice, raised the issue to do with the gap. And from the framework itself, even when this framework is in existence, we have a challenge. A study done on religion and marital status among adults we realize that they also have challenges. Those that have been married for some time, although some are silent, they are going through different challenges, regardless of being born again or not. Look at a scenario that Professor raised of a couple that was, you know, a, a, a female who was killed because of denying her, her husband the conjugal rights. And we are, ask, we are asking ourselves, why do they have all these problems? Other studies are looking at uh, prayer and worship. They are looking at uh, religion and how to endure marriages, but they have not done a comparative study to look at what transpires with the born again and the non-born again and how their experiences relate to their endurance in marriage, particularly in Ankole Diocese. Uh, the third person was uh, Dr. Milton. While we recognize the intervening and moderating variables, I want to agree that this study has highlighted that further studies be done to consider uh, the variables that may influence this longevity in marriage and also go ahead to look at other religion because this one looks at the Anglicans only. So we felt would do a disservice to the born again and unborn again is related to their spirituality if we compromised by other factors because this is a belief that they are devoted to. So we appreciate your comment, but we are recommending that for further studies, we can look at that as researchers that are in the related area of study. Then number four was uh, Dr. Kedres. I believe the statement related to culture, yes, we are going to rewrite. Thank you for the observation. We should have taken on something to do with marriage norms, to be specific with where culture, uh, which culture we are talking about. And then Professor Gershom, I was inspired and actually <laughs> shocked by findings on the side of born again, first of all, the way how this person goes through torture, psychologically is battling alone, but is in bestiality. But he's a born again, committed, but is battling with it. But through his experiences, his uh, tendency and commitment to going to church, attending sessions, and eventually is able to now come back to the normalcy we may refer to and stabilizing his marriage. And we're imagining what if he wasn't born again? Where would he have got the healing? And also to do with the non-born again, I was also uh, shocked, actually, by these small gods, and these are Christians, but this woman is saying, I have been feeding the small gods for all this long. Shockingly, and what is most sad about it is the daughter as well, 
got married to a home where she is going through the same. And her daughter was coming back to the mother always until the mother sat her down and said, my daughter, it's unfortunate you're going through what I am going through. Both had to cry. When you listen to this audio, you're like, what makes them stay there? And the mother says, my daughter, go back and cling on. That is what marriage is. We set you off. You are not supposed to be here. They are not born again. But they are looking at how will the society see me if I don't cling there. Finally, Professor, maybe Fred, you'll answer why Isinjiro is not taken care of. Isinjiro, already we have in this book, we have there four couples, but those are very few because your area, you need to look at why you are few. <laughs> there are reasons. Isinjiro is not very religious, by the way. To come to think about it. When I became a, uh, a bishop, there is a, a, a Christian I met. He used to be a friend of Honorable Amirama. He used to tell me, the Sinjiro area, they are very rich, uh, uh, Matoke, that you get lorries of Matoke going out and lorries of uh, alcohol coming, lorries of uh, rice, lorries of mandaz. That's what he used to tell me. And even uh, Reverend Vyaru Gava, uh, Reverend Vyaru Hanga, he has been there, I don't know how many years. So even education has been low. I tell you about uh, results of education. Isinjiro, whenever we would be waiting for our results of PROE, we would get all other regions, and we would, Isinjiro would come last. So Isinjiro, when it comes in, maybe we are at 22%, first grade percentage pass. When Isinjiro comes in, we move down. But now there is positivity. And uh, so in many cases, they've not been as um, matters of faith, really. Uh, not, but you have four. four uh, but also, it is possible to miss out. This research cannot be 100% impossible. There is no research which can be 100%. So when you say there is a case in Western College that is one a drop in the ocean, so... Maybe to mention, in addition, Professor, that out of Ankole Diocese, uh, Bujaga is one of the archdeaconaries that had most of the unborn again Christians. When you look at the statistics from the preliminary findings, the magazine is around, is there, sorry, you will realize that most of the Christians who are not born again are from Bujaga's archdeaconary. And those that are mostly born again are from Chinon Archdeaconary. And that is what drives at, uh, drive us to do a comparative study. They are all 50 plus in marriage. But you see, those are not born again, many of them in that Archdeaconary, and many born again in the other Archdeaconary. And that is where we were basing ourselves to do the sampling, uh, uh, base. okay, to make the sampling from the different Archdeaconaries. And when you look at uh, Chinoni, you come from Chinoni. I'm the head of you, you know Eric Sabit, where the brethren used to meet. The revival center. Aha, uh -huh, including the wife, including the mother of President Museven. That's where they used to meet, the revival brethren. And as a result of that fire, you find in Chinoni, that's where the highest number of the born again, married, including the other one who was about 76 years, you know them. That's, that's the reason. They, they are not like a singer. I hope you went to <laughs> Mrs. Kalala. Yeah. <laughs> right. If you interacted with the Mrs. Kalala, you would have gotten the feel of the late Archbishop Sabit and his revival fire something. Thank you so much. I couldn't believe that this is a girl I taught in P4. When I saw knowledge coming out, you need to clap for me, you. <laughs> Thank you. I think because of time, we are going to leave it to this.
we cannot take in any more. But we are very happy that uh, we have shared. And uh, in the house, we have our internal auditor. Please, here he is. Please welcome him. I'm sorry at first I did not recognize you. In the house, we have Professor Kazibwe. Professor Kazibwe of Public Health is with us. So, in the house, um, yeah, you, you, you are all welcome. I'm very, I beg your pardon for calling you my student. I didn't know you were a visitor. I have a student uh, in master's who has the same color. I'm very sorry. Uh, I beg to hand over back to the main chair and thank you so much. Madam Alice, thank you for coming again. And we are, we, we, we are thinking of giving you one student. Just one. Just one. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Our presenters, thank you very much. They deserve another clap. You have done really, we can see you are on the way and you are doing great. And uh, we thank God for that. Uh, we are now going, uh, but before, uh, before we go to, to launch the book, our missioners are here. Our missioners are here. Please, may you stand up for recognition. Yeah, please come in front and we appreciate you. Please come in front so that people can see you. Yeah, please, our mission has come. Yeah, our mission has come. Yeah, and, and please introduce yourself in two minutes so that we know you more. Thank you so much, our Father in God the Chancellor of this University, the Vice-Chancellor, and all protocol observed. My name is Alex Abraham Buambale Batsemae. I serve within this Church of Uganda under the Daniel Mission or Leadership Training Center, Daniel Uganda Project, a ministry of Church of Uganda focusing on raising leaders, from children and youth for this nation and for the church by equipping especially their ministers. Thank you. You are most welcome. Please always come to BSU. You can have it as your second home. Yeah, we are now going to launch the book uh, entitled a simplified quantitative methods approach. And you know how quantitative issues are. Those of you who have looked at them. I, I remember how Professor Kazo was teaching us that paper. Some students ran away when we reached at his section. Yeah, so now let me call, give uh, Boaz, I'm giving you three minutes. Uh, talk about yourself and your book. As you go to launch it, you are welcome. Thank you, moderator. Uh, my Lord Bishop, and the acting Vice Chancellor, Professor Kagame, and all members in the house. My name is CPA Bawazim SJ. I work as head of station Yara M. Barada. Uh, a number of years ago, five years, with my team, we dedicated to coming up with a simplified quantitative methods approach. This is a subject that is done by almost business, students doing business courses and it's also cross-cuts in other disciplines, like social, social, social sciences, they will find this 
subject relevant to their day-to-day -day activities. And we sat down and we said, this paper has been a daunting task to students. What can we do? Basing on our experiences, when we are studying it, we said we can do something. So I, I and a team of two, in the names of Trevor Muwanguzi and Rwachinanga Samuir, who works as the principal revenue officer at Mbara City, uh, sat down and documented a book in this line of quantitative methods. And we came up with a draft copy of it. From there, we gave it to, to the public to review it. This book got reviewed by 25 lecturers, including some CPS and four professors. Uh, it was also reviewed by my le lecturer who was teaching me at Mbara University recently. I was doing a master's, uh, Dr. Perez Mojundi, just among the reviewers. Among other reviewers include Professor Varinua of MOOBS, includes Professor Kamkama Nixon of Mbara University, uh, CPA Turiamari Badenis, then uh, among others, we had to give it some people to give it a naive view to add in what, what probably was missing in what we had come up with to add it more value. So when the, when the bishop was presenting here, he affirmed as to why 2M is relevant to each and every person. Because he was asking himself if a school has got 147 A's in one year, then followed by 74, then you moved 17. What kind of a graph is that? And you cannot draw a graph when you don't have knowledge of quantitative methods. And that leads to a topic of straight lines. So minus having a knowledge in that area, you, can re you cannot really plot any graph and it comes through. Uh, we, this, this subject is interesting in a way that even if you are a reverend, even if you are a bishop, you need it. Because you will, you will find in my book, it was intentional that I made sure that I did I, I, I put it to criticism to a number of people. It was even reviewed by a reverend. This is the reverend Akang Mejokas Mbagaya, who is the deputy head teacher at, at entire school. And my intention was simple. To look at my mathematics bit of it, now he comes with the literature element, see if the English is flowing. So, but, the, but in all this, I was trying to see how best I can come up with the the court output to the public. So you'll find things which are in that book, they are so much pertinent to our day-to-day -day lives. You and me, if you have a business outside there, you'll find your objective is uh, to maximize profits. And for you to do that, you must first lower the costs for you to maximize profits. You must lower what you're injecting in a business. And that knowledge is found under the top code calitras. So 2M is positive message is part of us. And uh, you'll find if you are doing linear programming, you want probably you are selling motorcycles and cars, you have a business. You want to know what product mix that can enable you to maximize profits. How many motorcycles, how many cars. You have to do that with the knowledge of uh, linear programming. So it's like I had a lot to share with you but it seems time is not uh, on my side. But what I can say, this is the book, a, a simplified quantitative methods approach that I have, together with my team, and a number of, and a number of editors, I have a team, um, uh, my friend, Kod Boaz, he happens to be in this house, is my namesake, and he did a lot. You can stand up for recognition, Boaz. This, is, uh, this gentleman has been on the auditorial team of this book. So we, we chose to have this book produce the public for both 
for both students, the policy makers, administrators, and even managers at all levels, because every person here is a manager in his or own way. And uh, I cannot fail to mention this before my Lord Bishop leaves with this product on the market when I tried to publicize this intent of launching this book. A friend of mine, I was planning to, 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 to give out some textbooks to this university, having given me a platform to, 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 to launch my book from this institution. But as I was thinking of the same approach, now a friend of mine who happens to be the former head teacher of Mbarara Municipal School, he donated 10 books to 10 needed students. He has already paid for 10 students. So that means straight away, on the copies I've, I've brought on this launch, 10 copies have already been paid for students. Probably I will engage the relevant authorities to advise where those books can be spread among different students in different disciplines. In the interest of time, I have a PowerPoint which I will share, which is talking a lot on what this book is all about. And maybe before, before I finish also, let me say this. This book, now it's accessible in Adit Bookshop. It's accessible in Aristoc. It's accessible in some other bookshops in Kampara. But as an institution, uh, so long as students express the need to utilize this book and see the best it can help them, because we are talking of employability as a topic, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as a theme for today. So when in the relevant, in the dynamic business environment, students can be able to relate with the business community when they understand all these concept, concepts that are embedded within this book, and I've given it sufficient examples and practice questions with their answers at the end of it. So I believe the students and the, uh, and the public will, this, will find this book resourceful for their academic career and employment journey. I submit. Yeah, thank you very much, Boaz. Uh, and now, uh, Dr. Donna, before I forget, make an order for these books because they are almost wanted throughout the whole, facu the whole faculties. Yeah. Uh, we are now moving out to launch the book, but before we move out, I do believe that the Chancellor has something to say. Thank you. And uh, Boaz, when you, are, when you are launching a book like here, I would have expected you to, to present a copy to the chancellor, present a, present a copy to the vice chancellor, present a copy to the chair council, present a copy to the master of ceremonies. <laughs> that is the order. That is the order. That's how I know my do. That is the order. Present I, copies to us. As, as a researcher, I need to protect him. Yes, because even I had told him, please, I need to pay you for this copy. He has already donated. I have published books, and people just end up getting free copies. Ah, no. Better protect. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Sometimes you look at things and you admire knowledge. Really. And you do what? Admire knowledge. It's amazing. I've been scanning through and I see the stars, I see the different planets, and I will have a chance also to try and have a look through. But I want to take this opportunity to congratulate our brother here, CPA Boaz Mwesije, for burning the midnight candle because to come to a process of writing a book and it being reviewed, as he has told you, the processes he has gone through, it takes commitment, it takes courage, it takes valor. So I want to thank you and I congratulate you and I pray that those who get this book and make use of it <clears throat> will be greatly helped I will read for you just one statement 
<clears throat> which was using to show. You know, when I was making my presentation in the morning, I told you of how I was a, a student who would say, me, I'm a man of literature, language, history, religion. Where do I find mathematics? <coughs> but when I went on to read and to do research, I found myself in, in fact, these days, when I'm speaking, the people I work with, one other name they can call me is statistics now. Who of all people can, would have thought that I am a person who would be interested in statistics? They know that whatever, if I'm writing an article or whatever, there is statistics. And me, I'm, you would call a pure arts person. So you can't avoid this world, especially you who are young. Especially you who are young, please don't avoid this. Here he said, he was trying to describe how this is supposed to be in use for every other uh, person. Um, where is it where you say that in a daily life you have to use, uh, you know it best where you think is look for it. In daily life that you have to use mathematics or something like that. Uh -huh. Show me where it is. Mm -hmm. Preface. Uh -huh. Yes, where about it? Page five. Uh, yeah, it says, in life, we are surrounded by a forest of questions, but with a desert of answers. These questions are social, economic, political, statistical. This book provides an interesting nexus of quantitative methods that are geared towards, towards answering some of the life's questions, questions of life. The ever unceasing urge to quench the thirst of answering these questions that affect our daily day to day lives from individual families, organizations. The book will be of immense value to the people of all walks of life. You can't avoid this. It will be a blueprint to the success of students of business and related courses, especially at a higher level. Uh, there is where you also say that in ordinary life, you find you have to use the principles of this book. Anyway, that one has already been mentioned. So I would take this opportunity to launch it, and I would recommend, I don't, I, I don't direct, I would recommend that the copies for the needy go to the library where the wretched of the earth are very many, and they will set aside time to come and look out for them, because if you look for 900 people in Bishop Stewart University, it will be very hard. So best if they go to the library and then the rich can buy. End of quote. <laughs> in the name of God the Father, come here, come here. In the name of God the Father and the contributor, come, 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 please. Hey, it's very significant. We want to launch. Did you say we are launching from outside? Yeah? Okay, there is a space. Okay. So let us have a prayer to give thanks. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this book. We know what it takes to write a book like this. The endless effort, the endless time, <coughs> commitment, resources, frustrations here and there. We thank you that credible, authentic, People have read through and have approved. We pray that you bless these books as they are in circulation and that they will be bought and they will be used. We thank you, we praise you, we honor you. May you bless Boaz and his team. We pray all this through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you all. May that blessing never leave you now and always. Amen. Off we go off. I mean. uh, we have come to the end of this session and we praise God so much that we have come to the end of this session now it is time for lunch uh, but uh, my Lord as you, re as you move outside you are going to sign on the launching board there's a launching board where we're going to sign. 
uh, where also the vice chancellor will sign. It has already been launched, but with the signing, it will take place outside. Thank you very much. And Levanda Mukundani, after that, you take, you take people who are on the table. Uh, they, I will continue for lunch. And Dr. Johnson, we have our variables here. We have our laptops, we have our phones, we have our computers. Ensure that they are safe. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go and uh, launch the book.
Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, I am presenting my paper. This is an extract from my dissertation. And my study is about career guidance and counseling, occupational information knowledge, and career self concept among secondary school students in Ankole sub region, southwestern Uganda. So, when we talk about career guidance, there is always a, a challenge. People confuse it with guidance and counseling, but the two are distinct. Although career guidance is part of guidance and counseling, although for it, it focuses on helping people to make the right choices in their career life. So this is a historical uh, movement, but right now in Uganda, uh, it is being overseen by the Ministry of Education, and it is aimed at achieving SDG 4, having been modified from MDG 4. So <clears throat> unless we do record what students experience in the area of career guidance, we shall continue making the same mistakes, and we may not do much in the area of graduate employment. So the problem statement is, um, what is wrong? Schools are doing career guidance, but excuse how come... Me, excuse me, members who are serving, please, you are actually uh, disrupting us. Please, can we have order? Continue. Yeah, how come that students, after graduation, they struggle with finding the right career choices? So I had three objecti four objectives. One was to assess students' levels of career awareness and utilization. I wanted to establish students' levels of occupation, occupational knowledge, occupational information knowledge, and also assess students' career self-concept. And then I wanted to do find the moderation between the three. Um, I'll skip the questions, but the questions were direct from the objectives. And I had two hypotheses. One, I wanted to establish if there is any significant relationship between career guidance and students' career self-concept, and then occupation information, if it moderated the relationship between career guidance and counseling and students' career self-concept. Our variables, independent variable is career guidance and counseling. And in this, we are looking at programs, timing, mode of delivery, source of career information, nature of career guidance and counseling, and the challenges. Then the dependent variable is career self-concept. We are looking at career choices, school subjects, work values, and career interest. The moderating variable is occupation information knowledge, and this is in the areas of self-knowledge. The second area is educational and occupation information exploration, and the third one is career planning. My study was guided by, th by two theories and one model. The first theory is career development theory, 
where it is stipulated that our career development go through stages. Um, there is uh, the first stage, we call it growth. The second is exploratory establishment, where some of us are, we are working to maintain. And then the other one is decline, especially when we get to retirement. Of course, there is a new talk where people are saying the older, the wiser. But in the area of career development, after 64, people decline. Uh, then we looked at personal environment fit theory by John Holland, where he says that people find satisfaction when they work in environments that fit their personality. And then we looked at the mode of career counseling, whereby people make career decisions based on the information they process in their brains. The methodology I used marked stage designs. Uh, there were three stages. The first stage was baseline. I wanted to find out what people know about career guidance and counseling. The second stage was experimentation. We wanted to know if students were sensitized, will the acquired knowledge change the career information they already know? And here I used a randomized control trial, which included both a control and an experiment, an experiment group. Then the third stage was to generally survey whether people did uh, treat, were treated or not, whether they could understand their career self-concept. This, this was a survey using a standard tool. Our population of study were secondary school students. And uh, our sample size was determined using the Morgan and Craig, Craig and Cr Morgan uh, the, the, uh, formula. So in Ankole sub-region, we have 383. Uh, we had um, 326 secondary schools, which are government-aided. Then students in A-level were 123,547. However, to come to the actual number, we used a simple random sampling criteria using inclusion and exclusion criteria. And the basis was I picked on schools which, are, which had A level and had an enrollment of 1,000 students and above. And even then, among those, I looked for those schools which had about 100 students in A level, both science and Arts. So we came up with four schools, and the sample was 400 when we estimated 100 per school. Our data correction methods were used a survey, and the survey used one self administered questionnaire at baseline, and then the CDM at stage three, and then experiment at stage two using NOIC. This is an instrument adapted from the US, which has competencies for high school that helps them to uh, select their careers. Um, data collection procedure, I got clearance from my school. I studied from McKellar University School of Psychology, and then I got ethical clearance from McKellar uh, Research Ethics Committee of Social Sciences. And then final clearance, I got it from Uganda National Council of Science and Technology. Again, got clearance from schools and participants. Uh, results, results one. You have five minutes. Results one i found that students had good awareness of career guidance and counseling 98 percent said they were aware that their schools were um, they were offering guidance and counseling but of these only 187 percent uh, had used it 30 13 percent had not the main counseling services we established in schools were careers day those of you who are in schools, you know there is one day where they call parents and everyone comes, and then they invite guests. So that's the main area where career guidance is practiced. 
and it is usually offered, offered at the beginning or end of term. And then the main source of information that students mentioned was that they gain career information from professionals, where you and I lie. Uh, however, we had challenges which still for career guidance and counseling in schools, and these include students, teachers, administrators, parents, and policy makers. They have minimal uh, engagement with students. Uh, then occupational information levels, I had 12 competencies, but I've picked out the few competencies where students need a lot of guidance. One, students do not relate their physical development to their career choices. So when students become adolescents, they don't know that that has an impact on their career choices. Secondly, students do not have limited knowledge of understanding how positive attitude to work affects their career choices. Then the other one, they also have difficulty in locating uh, and evaluating employment. So you see people advertise, but getting this advert and then internalize and then say, this is good for me. Students have limited information. Again, they don't connect their study and their careers to needs of society. People just speak on careers. Again, they also did not find a lot of information for both groups about the role of gender in career choices. They, both groups had limitation. And again, they also did not uh, have an idea of how life rolls. If you are a woman and you have roles as a mother, how they affect your career choices. Then research question three was about career self-concept levels. One, we found that students were very good. They had an idea of the career choices they wanted to make. But when it came to aligning their school subjects to their career choices, only 62% could align their, the subjects they were doing to their career choice areas. And then the work values, this is what we look for in work. 78% had a very good grasp, but abilities of performing certain careers was low. People may want to be doctors, but do they have the abilities? So that was at 60.9, which means that we need to do a lot of career guidance for our students. I'm sorry that I don't know the screen is not so big, but went and looked at the distribution of careers. I know, I don't know, but different, some of us are coming from different faculties. But look at this. Most of the students at high school, they want to, they identify more with sciences. Uh, for LIGO, my brother Norman, only 17% of the students would want to make law as their first choice. Yeah. Then school subjects, again, you can see those gaps. Students are inclined to math, to finance. This is economics, sciences, and then they are neglecting these other areas, meaning that our students are still influenced by traditional biases when they are, they are selecting their careers. The work values, all the students were saying they would choose a career because of good salary. No one wants to take risk when they are choosing a career. The abilities, they were competent. Uh, they showed that they had good abilities in almost all areas, except for musical and spatial. Then I went ahead and looked at personality. How do these students' pattern of choosing careers fit in their personality? We have six, uh, six subtypes. The majority of the students, much as they were choosing medical, the majority are conventional. Sorry, where has this gone? The majority are, they actually lie in conventional. In conventional, this is where we actually have the law. We have law, we have um, accountants, we have uh, administrators. So the majority of students lie there, if you look at this. This is followed by business, the majority of our students. So this actually beats the idea that our students can actually do sciences which is the government policy. It's unfortunate uh, Madame Kedres' uh, doctor is already gone, 
But what the policy is saying that students must do sciences, the student's ability is actually very, is not good. Uh, when you look at this investigative, this is, this is for people who are likely to do medicine. 13 would choose medicine as their first choice, but 45 will not choose it again when given another opportunity. They are likely to look for other areas. So meaning that the choice of sciences is simply superficial. So we need to honestly come out and guide that much as we are going science, which is required, but we also need to help people do careers that are aligned to their personalities. And this will help to minimize the unemployment problem. Guidance and counseling and then career self-concept were positively related. However, the sensitization did not change what people knew. Although again, we found a significant relationship between occupation information knowledge and career self-concept. Conclusion, there is strong evidence of career guidance and counseling utilization in our schools. However, students need support so that they balance, they change the bias from traditional and they embrace all the other career areas to minimize the gaps in unemployment after graduation. Recommendation, um, the main recommendation is that career guidance that is being given in schools, one, it should address change, changes in the market, job market, technological changes, we are in the fourth industrial um, revolution, but also it should be aligned to the SDGs and the national development agenda. I thank you. I want to appreciate my uh, institution, which is training me. I'm in my last stages of my PhD. Those are my supervisors. I also want to appreciate Bishop Stewart University. I have partial funding and uh, my family also, and you, the audience, who have attended with, them, with me. Thank, thank you, you very much, Anne, for your presentation. You can, uh, have a, you can have a seat, and then we call upon another presenter. Then thereafter, we shall ask the audience to interact with you. Uh, Jordan, please. Sorry? No, you are supposed to sit up there. <laughs> to work on. Jordan, you have 15 minutes to present your work. Grammar, please help Jordan to connect. Good afternoon, members. Jordan Amanira are my names. And uh, my presentation is about depression, associated factors, and psychosocial interventions. Yeah, this one. 
Hmm. Among elder, older person living with HIV. <laughs> This is we. Yeah, members, as we are all here, the recent study which was done by Makerere University in conjunction with Minister of Health it has revealed actually 30% of Ugandans have mental disorders. So you can just cross check yourself. Out of 10, the three of us have mental disorder. It could be depression or any other mental disorder. So you see the burden of the problem we are having. So that justifies that you say the, the, the leads have this study and find out the possible strategies we can put in place to address it. This one, according to how we have seen, there are about 50 slides. And I have only 15 minutes to present this. But my major emphasis will be on objective four, three, which is about effectiveness of behavior, behavior family therapy in reducing depressive symptoms. That's where I'm going to put much emphasis on. Yeah, when we talk of depression, it is a mood disorder which is characterized by persistent low mood and also loss of interest in pleasurable activities. If you have been in, eh? is that one? Okay. Yeah, that, that is according to World Health Organization. And Uganda, according to the study which was done, was among the top six countries in Africa which had high burden of depression. And uh, in Uganda, the highest number of people with depression was, were reported in northern Uganda. Probably this was because of the insurgency in northern Uganda, because of corner rebels, as we all know. When we talk of older persons, those are, who are, those are people who have 60 years and above. And according to studies done, these people are prone to many challenges, depression inclusive, according to those studies which were done. This study was guided by the Cognitive Behavior Family Therapy. This Cognitive Behavior Family Therapy, which says that it proposes that thoughts, emotions, body sensation, and behavior are all connected, and thoughts affect the feeling. So this is the theory that actually is backing this study. Problem statement. Uganda government knows that this problem and has put in place intervention to address it. However, the number of people who are older, eh, because the, in Uganda, <coughs> what is happening actually, people now are dying at the older age. Actually, life expectancy is increasing. And because of that, we are continuing to have these problems which are associated with old age. And with HIV, the burden of depression has increased because these HIV patients have opportunistic infection, peer burden, some even are stigmatized, and all roads upon this background that the study is done, find out possible ways of how we can address this problem. So I have three objectives. The first one was about, was about a systematic review about psychosocial interventions that have been proven to be effective in, in, in managing in depression by primary caregivers of Southern Africa. The second one was to determine the prevalence of depression. The third one to explore factors. And the first one where I'm going to put much emphasis is to assess the effectiveness of behavior family therapy in reducing depressive symptoms among older persons living with HIV. Yeah, this is a conceptual framework. You can see how different factors are responsible for depression. Yeah, methodology. I have a study designs. There are three. One is systematic review. The second one is cross-sectional study, and the third one is a randomized control study. Yeah, this is a systematic review which I may not discuss now. And randomized control study. Actually, I found out the effectiveness of behavior family therapy in reducing depression. Behavioral family therapy is, a psycho is, a, is one form of psychotherapy where the family patterns is looked at as an entity in managing depression. And it has been proven in developed countries. It has been proven in developed countries to be effective in management of, of psycho psychosis, alcoholism, learning disabilities, 
uh, anxiety disorders and I found it would be very important to find out whether this one is also would be very helpful in managing depression in a Ugandan setting. So I wanted to find out now, is behavior family therapy versus routine care? Can behavior family therapy be effective in reducing depression compared to routine care? That was what the study was all about. So how it was administered? Behavior family therapy, one, there was community engagement. Community engagement, I involved community members and community leaders, and appointments were done with these people. Then, family engagements were also done. Then from there, when I reached the patients' homes, there was an identification of family resources, sharing with the family members about the depression and the best communication skills, of, of course, were used. And with discussion with the family members, goals were set, and I had to have weekly meetings with these people, and uh, after following them up. And after four months, there was this engagement, and then these people were in where we assessed for depression to find out whether that intervention was effective or not. So when we talk of routine care, this is actually what happens in government and the private health units. This is the, the flow chart of how what people go through when we talk of. So this is what I compared with behavior family therapy to find out whether behavior therapy, family therapy can be effective compared to this approach as we have seen it. So the study was done, study area at the health centers. That's on Barara and Yakari Health Center, Kakoba, by Municipal Council. And the target population was those who are 60 years and above. And the sample size was 265 respondents who were determined according to the Tarya money formula. And they were selected from those study sites. And uh, for the systematic review, not, not systematic review, for the behavior family therapy, I considered 22 patients. These are the patients who were found to have moderate severe depression. They are the ones that actually I considered. So these are the inclusion criteria. And uh, I want to go now to, to the findings, key findings. Before that, let's look at the ethical issues. It was approved by the by, by University of Science and Technology and also the National Council of Science and Technology. There was community engagement. The administrative clearance was sought from the study sites. There was informed consent and confidentiality, of course, and, private, and privacy was also ensured. So these are the results, but these are for systematic review. I'll discuss it another time. I want to go strictly now to the findings according to the, this, these are the findings from the prevalence of depression. This is what I found out. Out of the 65 that were, were interviewed, those who had moderate severe depression were 1.51%, moderate depression was 6.79, and those who had no depression were 50. 29%. So, this is how I found out the factors which were responsible for depression. And they're the ones mainly which I considered here. Yeah, the factors that were, were found to be responsible for depression, one, were the number of family members the patient was staying with, and also those who had problems with ARVs, and those who had ever gone to the center not be attended to. Those, ones, those were the major factors that actually were found to be related to, to the depression. And we also had psychosocial factors related to psychosocial intervention, and one of them was whether this person had ever had a cancer, and also whether the cancer had been helpful. The other factors were not significant. So, when this study was done, it was found that actually 8.3% of the people had moderate severe depression. So those are the people who now were done behavior family therapy. What I did, those 22 people were divided into two groups. One group was, was the intervention arm, another group was on routine. So those on, who were on, on intervention arm are the ones who were actually who were, who were provided with behavior family therapy. And how it was done, I have already explained it. So these are the social demographic characteristics of those 22 people. And as you can see, this table, yeah, actually it was found actually that after intervention, those who had mild depression, those who had mild depression were those ones who were not currently married. And those who had, uh, those who had mo mo moderate depression are those who are currently married according to that graph, as you see. 
So, this is also a, a finding now. We did a t-test to find out, surely, is there any relationship? Is the behavior family effective? So we found out that those clients who are on routine care, the depressive mean average, those who are on, on, on behavior family therapy was 9.18, and those who are on routine care was 9.68. So the difference was 0 0.46. So from this graph, when you critically look at that, that graph, it shows that actually, that the depressive sim the main depressive symptoms was not statistically significant. So, yeah. my null hypothesis actually was rejected. Jordan, you have three minutes. Yeah, and um, when you look at this graph, I was trying to find out, I was trying to do the statistical what? Significance. But statistical significance itself may not be enough. And that's when I also went to find that to do what they call effect size to find out the practical significance. And when we did this, we also found that actually there was no relationship, but the effect is there and small, which should not be neglected. Much as it is small, it should not be neglected. So, what are the now the, 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 the conclusions which you need to know? Psychosocial intervention might be more effective in reducing symptoms of depression compared to control conditions. There is no prevalence of depression, 8.3, and the number of family members or the people they with are also very helpful. And also, behavior family therapy has a small effect in reducing depression compared to those who are on, on, on controls. So, some recommendations were made. One of them, as we have seen, government interventions. And other stakeholders need to look at the risk factors of this disease. There should also be other diagnosis of the disease. And also, what I did was a cross-sectional study, but I recommended to have a longitudinal study to address more challenges, and also to ministering mental health, mental health management in general health care, and also integrating behavior family therapy in general management of mental patients. So, this is what, these are my acknowledgements, my supervisors, all those people that actually have helped me. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Jordan, for your presentation. You can have a seat um, that I can call upon another presenter, who is none other than uh, Dr. Bahame. Free, please take it up. We have 15 minutes. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm to present a, a survey on knowledge, skills, and attitude towards research and innovations in the view of our postgraduate students at Bishop Stuart University, but particularly in the Faculty of Agriculture. Uh, I did this with my colleague uh, Bernard, is among us. You can stand for recognition. Yeah, as you know, all we are aware that uh, this is mine. Research is one of the activities that augment board of knowledge and based on research and development. So, however, it requires a higher level of ethics, integrity, and innovativeness to be performed. So, uh, to be performed better. So, the learners or students need the grounded research foundation uh, of competencies for them to position themselves in the research arena. Uh, the purpose of this study was to, uh, to investigate the research competencies 
among the Posogoyan students in the faculty of agriculture. And, and what motivated me to do this, I was given an opportunity to teach the students basically on graduate seminars. Then I was answering myself, well, asking myself, well, how do I teach something different from the normal research methods? Then I said, before I do this, let me make a central point to see what the expectation of the students and what they know so that I, I can wear to position myself. So particularly, we looked the, at the three research questions. Uh, what, what is the level of, the, of research knowledge and innovations for those students? Then the score writing skills and the research attitude. So it was a conversational study. Uh, that's what we adopted uh, across the, the master's students and the, the, the postgraduate students' programs in the faculty, just looking at the time of academic year 2022-2023 and 2023-2024. Because that's the time when I started teaching them. And uh, that one involves August and April intake. And uh, since the sample size was very small, I had to take the whole population. There are 92 students, and those, those were uh, my case study, or this, uh, the sampling unit. Uh, the, the method used, uh, we employed uh, the Google Forms. They just filled online, and they sent me or they sent us the responses, and the responses were analyzed uh, using other software, 4.23. This is one of the popular uh, data management software has used recently, currently. Uh, I don't know whether they are clear the scene. There were some questions I would just focus on only those that are, had the positive and negative response. Uh, like question four was asking how to explain the significance of the study. And when I put it in two sides, this one is just argumenting this side. Uh, then the response was strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, and strongly disagree. When you see on this graph, it is like a stack, a stack graph. The higher, the higher part of the graph looks at the strongly agree, this side. Then the opposite, the disagree, then the opposite, it's the agree. And it is arranged in the higher order. Uh, it was uh, on, on the issue of knowledge, the students agreed that they, they have less knowledge about research, despite the fact that they are in the classes of, of research methods. Then the next question was to answer the, the research skills. Still, there were no much difference. The, the, it was recognized by the study that they have less research skills. And they, they went ahead and said, that it makes them get scared when they are told that they are supposed to do research at the end of the day. The other one was attitude. Uh, on attitude, they express that they have better attitude on research or the positive attitude compared to the, the rest of the two of the knowledge and the skills. So that one came out uh, slightly, the percentage are high, and shows that you are really, uh, they like the, 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 the study, the research, but they like something small, how to implement it. Now we went ahead and do the chi-square, to take this out kind of significance level. Uh, we found out that uh, people, there was a question asking, people owning computer and having computer, are they better in doing research? study and, and, and skills. The, the thing was significant according to the chi-square, but when you came to class, we really found out that having a computer was not necessary, having a knowledge how to, to use it. So that's what happened. Um, then we entered to tease out, again, is there a need to be helped in doing the research? and using the computer and identifying the research gaps, it was highly significant. They, they said that they cannot, they cannot easily identify research gaps 
and are finding it a problem and sometimes drain them uh, not to finish their work. Yes, um, this, is my conclu this is our conclusion. Uh, admitted students on private post program, programs in FAST have a rich knowledge and skills and skills and innovations was identified. Having a negative attitude towards such uh, terms, it, it makes them uh, to face a dead rock in their master's program and, and diploma studies. Some of them, they think they will not finish because of that little knowledge. So they need more help on identifying the research gaps and use computer applications in research. Then there is inadequate knowledge and innovation skills shall hamper their employability opportunities in the near future. Because some of the employers, they need people have hands-on on these computers. So having a computer in front of us and without hands-on does not make any sense to an employer. So the study was guided, uh, <coughs> will guide the teaching and learning delivery approach. Because that's what, my, what went to my mind. How will I guide uh, these students? So I, I recommend that the, the graduation research seminars and square writing skills practice should be mandatory across all faculties and should be scaled up uh, this study to a possible programs in also other faculties because it is picking a raw, a raw value, a raw, a raw scale uh, in, our, in our university. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wahame, for your presentation. I think uh, you'll be able to share you are your research with us. I think it's very pert pertinent as far as your research dissemination is concerned. Um, thank you, all our presenters, starting with um, Anne, uh, Jordan, and you, David. So it's now the audience to ask some questions. Now, this session for Q&A is going to be handled by Dr. Ronald. Please, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. Uh, anybody with questions? I would have loved, though, that the presenters take up their seats up there and take on questions from the, from the audience. Meanwhile, okay, they did the first seat and then someone should help me with it. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bahati. Thank you, Dr. Bahame, Bernard, Anne, and Jordan. It, I just have one question and it runs across. Uh, who are the consumers of this work? I look at, for example, Jordan. You're talking about the elderly and you're trying to disseminate this information to them, maybe in a conference, or a dissemination workshop. And then we are talking about the language of there is no statistical significance, results are not uh, statistically significant. For example, to my elder HIV father, how will he understand statistical significance and maybe statistically not significant? Could we possibly have uh, a much simpler language? For example, if we said, um, uh, we establish that actually uh, guidance and counseling is not at all related to career choices of the learners. Now, to a simple person, for example, a learner, she will understand your findings that yes, career guidance and career choice of learners is not, is not related at all. So, I would think of a simpler language to some of our consumers of the knowledge that we are generating. Thank you very much. 
presenters are taking note. Anybody with any questions to any of our our presenters? Yeah, Mr. Wilbred. Thank you, Doctor Arnold. Uh, uh, my question goes to the group of uh, postgraduate research. I'm wondering why did you make a questionnaire, a tool generalizing the entire research skills? Because my assumption is if you talk to of maybe different softwares, someone might be good in this software and uh, good in the other one. But if you talk, uh, when you talk about general skills, I think that question is hard for someone to uh, specify exactly what you need. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Any other person? I have a few questions. Uh, to first of all, Madam Anne, the first question is uh, in the presentation you showed us that uh, there was a lot of career uh, career guidance and counseling awareness among the secondary school students. However, the utilization, the uptake was a little lower. Actually, was lower than awareness. So what factors do you think could be influencing utilization of these services? Secondly, what interventions could you be designing or thinking about, okay, relating ability to career development what interventions that you have put in place or thinking about that relate to the ability of career development among our students because there was a disconnect. Also, in conclusion, you said that uh, uh, in conclusion, I am I have a I have an issue with your conclusion because it was based on awareness. You concluded that there was utilization, yet the results are showing that there is no utilization. There is only there is majorly awareness. But the conclusion is talking about utilization. Now that is a disc that is a that is a contradiction. Utilization is not the same as awareness. So the conclusion is based on on results that are negative. Then uh, to to my friend Jordan, uh, my issues are very limited. Thank you so much, Jordan, for the far you have come from. I am happy for the fact that now where you are, it is really good work that you are putting out. However, to avoid some of the clumsiness that I saw in the presentation, it would be very good that you present only significant results. There are very many slides that are congested and someone cannot follow you. But the reason is you have pre chosen to present everything. I am sure that as a researcher, you are really interested in what you are doing. But us as audience, we want to see the the cut the the, the eye cutting issues. We want to see things that cut us, and we say, "Wow, this guy is doing a good job." But for you, you have chosen to power everything, significant and non-significant, causing us trouble to follow you. Uh, Now, you also presented to us some results to do with the depression, pay, paying, uh, painting a picture that actually this disease, depression, is really high among the elderly and these are HIV positive people. And for me, I assumed that was 
quite obvious. Because if someone has HIV, there is a likelihood that their mental well estate will be compromised. However, someone would be happy to tell to, to government and any other policymaker or, or humanitarian agents would be very happy if you told them that we've, you found that the prevalence of depression among your participants was this. However, what you presented here were categorical prevalences. So, so there is no prevalence. You need, to, you need to sum up the categories and come up with a clear prevalence of, of depression. Then when you are discussing the prevalence, you can tell us about these other categories, but there was no, there was no depression that there was no prevalence. Then you should also avoid stat uh, statements like, like uh, recent studies. Recent is 2020, 2020, 2021, 2024, or, or 1980. Because it is, it is also recent. So we need to know, make sure you avoid such statements like recent studies. Speak the time. Speak the time. Now to Dr. Bahame, David, thank you so much for this for that study that you are doing. I don't have a lot of questions for you. I only implore you to improve the, 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 the slides, but also to share, you share with us, especially at graduate school, the findings, because these are going to inform change of how research is handled within the graduate school. Uh, otherwise, thank you so much for for coming up with that. I would have loved though, if you did a comparative analysis of re how research is taught at BSU graduate school and also some other university so that we know. Otherwise, if we do not compare, we might be thinking that we are better off or we are better when actually other people are also doing the same. So if we compared, you have, you have a comparison group, it would be very good to have such findings. They would do, now your findings, you have limited them to BSU. Yet you would have loved, you, now which journal is going to, accept, you will find it very hard for a journal to accept such results because there is no comparison or there is no any other institution that you are comparing with. And you are comparing, you are only getting results from 92 people of the same, of the same faculty. What about the other? However, as BSU community, I think for me, I am very happy with what you have come up with. I thank you. Just in case there is anybody here who has any questions, uh, I welcome them. Or else, I requested the presenters in the order of how they presented to start responding to the raised concerns. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, there is somebody who asked the first question about dissemination. Dissemination is at different levels. You can disseminate in journals, you can disseminate university students, you can disseminate the community workers community residents, so when you, are when you are disseminating findings at the university level, the way you disseminate, and you are talking about the prevalence, you are talking about the p-value, you are talking about the, uh, the assumption that the university will be aware of what you are talking about. But as, the, as I've told you, at a later time I will disseminate the study sites, and also planning to disseminate to the, commu to the, to the, to the community. They, of course, when you, are when you are disseminating the community, you also put it in a language which actually they understand better. But uh, thanks so much for your concern. Then about uh, slides congested, actually that is true. And I have to appreciate I didn't have much time to, I had wanted specifically to present about behavior family therapy, but I found myself with little time to sort it out. But that would have been ideal actually to to avoid the conjecture not necessary. 
about the prevalence of depression, maybe it's because it maybe didn't come out well, but the prevalence of depression in elderly age, according to my study, was 8.3. Those are 22 patients who had moderately and severe depression. Those are the ones that I considered. But when I was presenting, I also considered those who had minimal, those who had uh, no depression, but those actually who had depression, according to my study, it was 8.3 percent, which is generally low compared to, to, to the national levels. Thank you. So, excuse me. So, if, if you present results that the, 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 pre, the prevalence of depression among the elderly is 8, I seem to see a situation where the recommendations will not be very valid. Because you are recommending big things to government. But government has a number of com competing demands that they must respond to. How do you see a, pop a, a prevalence of eight being, uh, being, uh, being considered a priority is issue? For government, especially the ministry, the ministry for for planning, leave alone the ministry of health where you belong. But now you go back to the ministry of finance, planning, and economic development. Will they plan for this eight percent? And how was it generated from only twenty-two people? So maybe that one you can consider it as if at some point you can list it among the limitations. You, you, you listed the limitation of, of be, uh, the study being cross-sectional, but also the participants need, you need to increase the number of participants. Otherwise, eight, again, which is equivalent to 22 participants, may not move government at all, including a health center three. If a health center three has 80% of the very many clients they get, they will consider this a non-priority area. So you need to recommend that a, a more larger study could be done. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, to answer Doreen, <coughs> who are the consumers of this study, the findings of this study? Uh, like I said in the problem statement, uh, we are doing a lot to teach, even to graduate, but many more young people are becoming unemployed, even when they have achieved uh, the highest uh, GPAs and all that. So the whole idea was to see is career guidance being done so that we minimize this challenge. So I, I, or ideally, the consumers are all of us. Whether you are a parent or you are a teacher or you are a, a professor at the university, because as soon as you graduate this child or this student, where or how have you prepared them to, to face the changes in the market? Because employment, employment has changed, shape, technology has uh, changed the landscape, so if we continue doing the things the same way, are we going to deal to help our national development agenda? Uh, so again, in the name of simple language, I would, uh, but this is a good note of, of observation. Uh, not everybody in the audience would understand the significance levels, but uh, being in the university, who are feeling comfortable with that, next time it will be better. Uh, but we encourage academicians to acquaint ourselves with that language. Then um, regarding uh, Dr. Bahati's question about the uptake of career guidance, maybe I should bring it. My conclusion was based on the fact that Many students were aware about career guidance and counseling, 98, only two people. And probably this gets us back to what I started with. Very few people can differentiate between guidance and counseling 
and career guidance and counseling. So may, basically, probably these students were saying, yes, we are aware, knowing that there is general guidance and counseling. Um, uh, those who utilized were 87 percent. So my conclusion was saying that people are aware and it is being utilized. Yeah, so I think it is still consistent. Um, then about the interventions to help students improve their abilities. Like I said, many students are picking on careers, but they are ignorant about what it takes to do that particular career area they are pursuing. So for them, they are driven by the desire to earn high, to get reputation. But when it ta what it takes to do the work, uh, my brother here, Dr. Bahame, if you're going to become an animal um, health worker, you really have to put on overalls. You can't put on high heel. So students need to know the whole package. And we are saying that because that is continually not being disseminated, many more students are graduating, but few are entering the job market. So as educators, it should, be, it should concern to, as we train students, we tell them what it takes to do respective careers. But this goes to uh, counselors, it goes to educators, it goes to policy makers. As we say, I talked about it briefly, as we say students do sciences, do they have the ability? Can we leave room for students to be flexible so that they do what is within their means? Because at the end of the day, we need scientists, but also we need social scientists for the world to move. I thank you. Thank you, moderator. I will start with Dr. Bharti's comments. I'm not answering. Actually, what uh, I've already said, what prompted us to do this, this is a baseline survey. That's why it is localized in one faculty with a small population or sample size. But there is a need to, to expound it outside the guests of BSU and within BSU other faculties. Um, Willie Broad asked a question on why this, on the other side of computer, having a computer, there were some other questions. If you have the computer, what other data analysis applications can you perform? SPSS, Stata, ALA, uh, using Excel, and others. Because uh, we also this doubt to know if these students know how to even uh, do the cleaning of their, of their data and all that stuff. Then also there was a question of still under the same umbrella of having a computer, if they, are, they have the knowledge on e-learning, having the knowledge of e-library, having the knowledge of digital research, uh, searching, searching skills, and also using data management skills like referencing methods. Uh, like here, we emphasize uh, Mendere, but we also go an extra mile to talk about EndNote and other uh, data management skills because those are the things that are scaring students when they leave the real research class. So now the hands-on application of to get the information becomes a program for them. And uh, the way I've said, uh, I so happened to attend some presentations of their concepts and some students were chased away because of plagiarizing uh, other people's work. But to find out that it will not be much of their problem. They are just doing the other such methods as a class for the purpose of passing, but the real application becomes a what? A problem. Unless uh, my colleague wants to add something. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I may not have a lot to add, but maybe to the audience, we just presented something small because uh, what we presented, we only looked at questions to do with research knowledge, then skills, and then attitudes. But there are more questions we asked, like, do you know any software you use for data analysis? If yes, which of these do you know? And then which ones have you ever used, and which ones do you think will help you in doing your data analysis? So we have all that data, but we just picked something small and presented. Uh, and if, actually, in total, we asked around, we have 74 questions. 
And these questions are actually the ones guiding us in packaging what we are giving them because we are running the analysis and then we see where their needs are and then we start from there. Including the softwares we are using, we first looked at what they know, what they think will help them and what is available as you are very much aware that some of them are not free and then we, we zeroed down to something that is user friendly and can be accessed by each and everybody. Uh, and like he said, uh, yeah, we used all the 92 people because those are the people who are participating in the research seminar. And uh, we, are, we, we welcome everybody that is interested and that's why he was talking about scaling so that maybe other faculties, like you talked about comparison, uh, like you may find it is only in FIES, but in other places, for example, it may work or going outside, though it needs something and this one we are doing it just out of ourselves so that we can be able to package our, our seminar presentation. So thank you for that advice and maybe we shall look into it and see how we can implement it. Thank you so much, the, the, the team that has presented. First, keep there a little bit. There is, there is some more... Uh, Madame Deborah has an issue here. Thank you, presenters. Mine goes to Madame Anne. Uh, you talked about uh, career guidance utilization in schools, but I was looking at the environment of the school boys and girls, whether the career guidance is the only factor that he that he can cause an effect on, uh, on the uh, job market, uh, the employment of the youth in the job market. So I asked myself what of the era, uh, those factors in Elatam that are, whether there is something that is happening or not, that, that situation is there for unemployment or what was the ranking of that career guidance as in line with the unemployment of the youth? Thank you. Adam could answer. One of the variables I studied were occupational information knowledge. Much as we celebrate guidance and counseling, are students getting the right information to help them make good career choices? So I picked, I picked on some competencies and indicators, which if students have good knowledge, they are likely to make very good career choices. But as you've said, there are three or four areas where I found discrepancies among the students. Uh, the first one was that some, most of the students do not attach their physical growth to the likely careers they are, like, they are going to make. And that's why I started by showing the theories that define career development. Uh, one of the theorists, Super Donald, says that career progression goes through stages. We have five stages. We have growth. This is where a child is growing and they have fantasy on what they want to be. That goes on up to 14 years. They are fantasizing. When you ask them, they tell you, I want to be a surgeon. I want to be a, a, a pilot. But during exploration, that is 15 to 24, they interact with the environment and discover that actually their fantasies are no longer reality. So there they really seek a lot of knowledge. And uh, by the end of, by 24 years, people have settled to the careers that they pursue in life. And that is also um, su uh, succeeded by um, um, other stages. But Another thing that I discovered is that our students have poor attitude towards different occupations. That's why when I was showing those bars, we find that so many students are running to medical, to science, but they are neglecting the occupations which are actually likely to open more doors for them. 
So as uh, career counselors or as teachers, we really need to help students to be at peace or at ease with the kind of careers they can choose that will help them access employment at any other level. But again, we also found that some students do not know how to read uh, those adverts. When they say there is a job in uh, animal health, even you'll find that among the applicants, me who has done maybe bachelor of, uh, of uh, maybe me who has done, uh, maybe I'm doing literature, I will come to, uh, to, to apply for animal health. So students also need to be helped to know how do they spot. Adverts will be there, but how can you spot the right uh, occupation that you can go for? So those are nitty gritties which counselors, career counselors are not doing, uh, which maybe my brother Bahati is asking, that we need to step up, especially in schools. Uh, then there another thing we found that some students cannot attach gender roles. Yeah, you want to be an animal health expert, but when you're pregnant, can you run with that cow? Can you, you know, put it down? You get that? So there is that we need to give a disclaimer so that they can do animal health but specialize in areas that they are, yeah, they, that is comfortable with their gender roles. Yeah, so all that we found a bit of gaps which need to be addressed in career counseling. Thank you so much. Our presenters, uh, they deserve a round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh, you can have now your seats here. Uh, we, ha we are coming to the close of the meeting, of the session. I am not a bishop in the, in the church. I am a bishop of other things. But when you <laughs> but 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 when you start the issues to do with the going to heaven, it is a race which we began in the morning. If we are to go to heaven now, you see the, the whole the whole the whole hall was really full. Now we are the only ones that have run a good race and reached at the end. So we need to also clap ourselves for starting and finishing. Uh, I also, they were here recognizing Bahat Ronald and uh, Dr. Johnson, but uh, there were also other people that really did us a good job. Madam Anna is there behind me. Uh, you just stand up for recognition. Mr. Simon. Yes, they, are, they have been doing us a good. There are some volunteers, Madam Ruth. You see, those two are coming from graduate school. I and Johnson from graduate school. Ruth is coming from US's office. A, a pure volunteer, no nothing, and this is graduate school. We also have uh, uh, Mr. Ezra from VC's office. Ezra, stand up for recognition. Thank you so much for standing with us. And we have Public Relations Office led by uh, leave alone the leaders, but the, the, the major player, the focal person, Reverend Charles Mukundani, stand up for recognition. These guys were not mentioned, but really, do you think two people would run such a thing as, as it has been? Really not. We also want to thank our service providers. Our service providers. Yes, we also had some people there who were taking us. They, they have gone away. They have, not go, they have not reached heaven. And we have some people here. <laughs> so I, I really thank people. But I also want to thank the service providers. The, 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 the people who, who designed. Yesterday there was a match here. The bishop faulted us. We would have done better. But we, there are factors that were beyond us. Yesterday there was a match. After around the nine, guys had to sweep, arrange seats, decorate, Bring, bring these ones and you know what there is also a mission going on so we have a lot of tasks that we are running at the same time we have also been online online the, these guys normally have a, yes a hit, a hit media we really want to thank you so much for giving us another plus uh, 
this is very, very good. This is really, really very good. Now, there is another guy altogether who is concerned about our security. Julius. You see, Julius. He had to be here to ensure that no nothing. He entrusts people with things and then keep here. And he has reached heaven from morning up to here. You see? So we really thank, we, we thank you, Julius. And the, the, the guys that have given us the eats, we also thank them so much. Now here, I would like to invite, to invite Reverend Charles Mukundane to, to give us a blessing. Close. You know when you are given to speak, you even, even forget to close. But make sure you close. Close and then give us more guidelines on what to do next. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ronald Bahati, for the, well, the job well done. Let's give him a very, very big clap, ladies and gentlemen. I have already been introduced, and I want to take the honor to uh, once again appreciate the work that has been done here and for all that have been able to attend, and especially those that have uh, persisted to this very end time of this workshop. Clap for yourselves once again. Now, uh, the Vice Chancellor is not here, the, the University Secretary is not here, the Academic Registrar, the Bishop has gone, now they have given me all those powers. So, I want to once again to thank them, those that have just left us, you know, in the morning it was really uh, 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 very vibrant. I was really very, very happy. How did you feel, Dr. Bahati? So good. It was very, very vibrant. How I wish the next time you arrange it also can be the same like it has been today. And it will. Why, why not? Uh, so I'm going to take the honor on behalf of the management of the university to close this workshop in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we are going to pray after having closed officially. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day and for the gift of life that you've given us, for all that have presented their work, the knowledge that they have uh, uh, taken us through and opened for us to continue understanding uh, what is going on in this world. We pray, Lord, that you bless them and all of us and continue, Lord, to use us to make more research and sensitize the, the community to know what is going on with them and be able to run away from some of the, the, uh, the dangerous circumstances that may swallow the society uh, uh, and make them uh, disorganize it. Lord, we pray that you continue to strengthen us, keep us safe, and make us your children. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, beloved, now and forevermore. Amen. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this has ended. But, you know, during the day, after uh, towards the lunch, we had a launch of uh, a book of uh, our, our colleague, uh, Mr. C.P.A. Mwesje Boaz. And so, he has also invited more other people, including us here to continue because he has prepared uh, uh, another program for us here. Uh, he has even prepared some eats. They are there. I hear they are roasting a goat or for you like what? Uh, whatever, but there is a very good program for all of you here. Okay, so don't run away. The, the few that will remain will be the ones to share. I'm immediately after here. A few, a few minutes to come. So they are preparing behind there. They are. No. The venue, by the way, because we are supposed to keep here, eh? They are going to have a garden. Okay. So. So that's what they have told you. Eh? 